Yeah, I think there we go. ready now. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all for uh, participating mm. in this uh, fourth uh, virtual meeting of the ERC IDEM um, uh, project, uh, which is based in Bordeaux. Uh, we cannot, as you know, meet in Bordeaux, so we meet on Zoom, and um, and this is very nice. Uh, so thank you again. And um, uh, as uh, for the previous times, we are video recording the uh, the talks, except for two, the one of Maria Rechino and the one of Sarkis Mesmanian. Um, if you are Twitter users, uh, please use Twitter to talk about us and the talks, which I'm sure are going to be uh, very exciting. Um, because it's already uh, uh, 3.39 uh, in Bordeaux, uh, I'm immediately going to um, um, say a few words about Gérard Hébert. Gérard Hébert is a professor of immunology at the Institut Pasteur or Pasteur Institute in Paris, France. He's the leader of a team uh, uh, called Microenvironment and Immunity. Um, Gérard is a very good friend, uh, so um, I can say that uh, he's uh, one of the best specialists uh, internationally about immune uh, microbiota interactions without uh, Gérard uh, feeling ashamed or anything like that. And uh, I am really excited about hearing you, Gérard, on uh, the, I think your topic today is setting the reactivity of the immune system early in life, the microbiota again. So the floor is yours, Gérard. Thank you again for accepting the invitation. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, how much time do you have? Uh, do, do I have? Uh, 30 minutes and then 24 discussion. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Um, thank you very much. And Margaret, I feel kind of uh, ashamed because I think you're going to talk Monday, right? Or last Monday. And I didn't attend. I could not. Uh, but it was French time. I really feel ashamed. Okay. I should just go and not pretend. <laughs> <laughs> <For that. laughs> Hi Scott, I didn't see you before, how are you? Um, okay, so uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about uh, uh, the impact of microbiota early in life and how microbiota is, uh, is important to determine in the long term the reactivity of the immune system. So I don't, uh, so the, uh, no, the audience is very mixed. There will, there will be some immunology. Uh, don't hesitate to uh, to stop me for any question. I think we have 40 minutes total, right? So uh, don't don't hesitate to interrupt me. It's, it's probably better. And I try not to drill in too much into immunology, which I didn't intend anyway. I try to stay uh, as much philosophical as I can <laughs> as I can claim to. Uh, so Gérard, just to be clear, yeah. we have 30 minutes and 20 minutes of Q and A's, so plenty of time. Oh right, okay, so plenty, okay. Until uh, until uh, four thirty, then I guess more or less. Yeah, four thirty. It's going to be Maria's turn, and I don't want to be late because everyone is uh, sure. super busy. But we have fifty minutes, so plenty of time. Okay, so let me share the screen. Uh, right. So I share this screen. So I guess you see my stuff, and now you see full screen. Yeah, that's perfect. Actually, it's just in the middle of the presentation. Let me just go back to the beginning. Uh, let me just get out of it. Uh, sorry for that. Gosh. Here we go. <laughs> you, see, uh, you see my pointer? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, okay. Um, the, the work I'm, I'm talking to you about has been done by this fantastic postdoc, because yeah, the Labani is now a, a postdoc with Andrew McPherson in Bern, and Marion Rancel was in Bordeaux. Uh, uh, she, she's a neuroscientist who worked on the impact of early life stress uh, on, on later currents uh, of uh, stress and anxiety in mice, and she also now works on, on, on this project. Um, so this is a slide I don't need to, to show, but I'm, you know, each time I look at it, I'm, I find it really cool because in, in red you have the staining, the fish staining of, of bacteria in the, uh, the mouse column, and uh, dark in blue, and you just, you can visualize you know, the extent of the biomass of bacteria 
in, in, in our colon, which is basically you know, uh, the same as the biomass of our own tissues. So this is just bacteria and uh, as a two boots to, to skip uh, from, from his review in, I think, yeah, 2009, where he makes uh, a, a, a non-complete uh, list of viruses which are with us. And uh, up to that point, we are all infected or not infected, we are all inhabited by, by these viruses. And he shows in the Nature paper how uh, a, herp, a, herp, a gamma herpes virus can confer is in a mutualistic relationship with us because it can protect from super infection by listeria, but at the same time can kill you if you become immunosuppressed. So a uh, few people work on the virome because it's much harder than the, bac the, uh, the, mac the, the bacteria, uh, bacteria so that's really tribute to the work of Skip and a few others. Okay, so uh, you know, your largest uh, tend to uh, to see uh, non-self as the enemy, so uh, uh, no people from the from the side of the wall being the bad guys. Uh, this is a traditional view of the immune system in terms, in terms of cell non-self. Uh, I, I think it's it's interesting to see a bit differently that uh, okay at birth we are more or less sterile to a large extent, and uh, you have a, a new type of cells coming in, such as bacteria and others, and these new type of cells add new functionalities to the, uh, to the host. And for intestinal bacteria, that is, of, that is of course obvious in terms of uh, digestion, in terms of uh, uh, production of uh, compounds, such as some vitamins and many others, and, and, and defense. So I think it's an interesting uh, view to, to see them just as new type of cells, as, no, uh, as, uh, as myself being a Swiss, I'm just a new type of uh, inhabitant of, uh, of Paris, adding, I hope, new functionalities to the city. Okay, so a few years ago, we showed that one of these functionalities is, is construction of the immune system. And what you see here is the construction of what we call isolated lymphoid follicles, which are basically uh, clusters of B cells making IgA, which contributes to the uh, equilibrium between the host uh, and the uh, microbiota. So what you see in green are cells which are called lymphoid tissue inducer cells because they've been first uh, uh, described in the fetus. And these guys are recruited to specific sites and they mimic an inflammation. And this inflammation leads to recruitment of lymphocytes and to the, uh, the construction of a, a, a lymph node, which are basically the storage uh, organs of, uh, of naive lymphocytes and stable throughout life. And uh, what we saw that after birth, you have, so this is uh, one of these lymph nodes, the pious patch, which is uh, the development of which is induced before birth. And then you have this large collection of, the, uh, of smaller uh, follicles, which are, are these guys, uh, lymphoid follicles. But there's something very specific about them, is that if you take a mouse which is empty of bacteria, you still have the pious patch, even though it's smaller, but you don't have these guys. You just have these so-called crypto patches, which are the clusters of these green cells, which are just there doing nothing. And when the bacteria come in, they're going to induce the activation of these guys to recruit B cells and make these lymphoid follicles, which are, as I said, competent to make antibodies to, to be involved in the, uh, in the homeostasis of the host with this microbiome. So what happens is that uh, epithelial cells in the gut have a, a way to sense the proliferation activity of the bacteria. That's a very old system, has been first shown in, in plants. And so these are uh, uh, proteins from the, uh, in mammals, well, not one and not two, there are many others, which sense fragments of the bacterial cell wall, peptidoglycans. And when they sense these peptidoglycans, which are really the the product of bacterial proliferation because they have to deconstruct the cell wall in order to be able to proliferate. When they sense these peptidoglycans, uh, these uh, structures get activated uh, and then uh, they're going to recruit B cells. I have to mention, like I forgot this point for, for some time, uh, we were um, motivated to look specifically into this pathway of recognition of peptidoglycans because of Margaret, because Margaret in 2004, it's really true, 
<laughs> in 2004, Margaret published uh, 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 you know, this incredible science paper showing how uh, 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 inflammation or kind of something which looked at inflammation in the in the uh, in the in the squid was induced was induced by peptidoglycan and uh, led to uh, uh, morphogenesis in the squid and that's the reason why we looked at this pathway and that Pasteur we have someone was a specialist of peptidoglycan which is uh, Ivo Bonnecke. Okay. Um, now, um, as immunologists, uh, and probably in the other system, we might have the intuitive notion that we are born uh, basically just small, and all we have to do is to, to grow bigger. And so there's also this notion, in, I guess, in the immune system that we are born with uh, basically an immature immune system, and this immune system just has to mature and gain experience. And I think that's, an, uh, that's a quite a wrong uh, perception. For many reasons, because uh, this period uh, between birth and at least tweening is very special, and a number of papers in the past have shown how special it is, and they've proposed that the near natal time window uh, that is between birth and weaning is uh, is a time window of opportunity uh, during which the uh, the the mammalian at least and uh, mammal at least has to be exposed to microbiota should be able to develop a number of things, at least at the, in the immune system, and that's probably true for the nervous system. Uh, Catherine Nagler uh, in Chicago has shown many years ago how treating mice early in life only with antibiotics leads to a, uh, um, uh, to future development into increased susceptibility to allergy. Uh, this uh, similar things have been shown by Katy McCoy and Andrew McPherson. Katy is now in, in uh, Calgary, and she shows that uh, a low diversity microbiota in life leads the immune system to develop a, 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 um, a polarized type two type of response, which which leads to higher Ig levels and uh, and uh, susceptibility to allergy. Brett Finley has been involved too, showing basically. Uh, the same, but these two papers really showed the, this notion of time window. Brett, when he uh, treated mice before winning with antibiotics, uh, this led to these mice to have enhanced susceptibility to allergy. But if he treated after winning, the, that was not the case. And I'm not sure if he did this in his paper or if, if uh, 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 Rick did, uh, did that in that paper, but uh, you can do the inverse experiment with germ free mice. And if they, you colonize young females with microbiota before weaning, you normalize the immune system. But after weaning, you don't normalize and the mice stay um, uh, hyperallergic later in life. So uh, uh, Rick Bloomberg in, at Harvard, he showed uh, specifically for uh, allergy type of response in the gut, again, that before the, the exposure to microbiota has to, has to be done before weaning and not after in order to normalize uh, the, uh, the immune system. And he showed that there was an element of epigenetic regulation of some genes in myelin cells, uh, which, uh, which did not occur for some reasons, did not occur after winning, but only before. And this stays, this remains pretty, pretty unclear why. So the, the view I have is rather that the ontogeny of the immune system is, is ongoing until maybe the end of, of weaning, and then we, we go into maturation. Um, actually, when you look at the, the element of the immune system, the cells, uh, in particular macrophages and others, they are really uh, uh, cells coming from the, from, from the fetus, and they had a different role. They had to, to, to be sure that the, uh, the ontogeny uh, unfolded correctly, and if cells are not the right place, they have to be eliminated. So at birth, the, the cells look fetal, and then you have a, some, some number of changes occurring so that then at that point here in time, you're actually ready to mature. And that's at a point when the immune system looks more uh, to what you have later in life. So if that is true, if you perturb this uh, uh, interaction between microbiota and the immune system during this time window, the expectation was that indeed you will have long-term consequences that just you know, showed a number of papers 
showing that there were indeed uh, long-term consequences when you perturb the microbiota. So what we did a, new, a few years ago was to, uh, to measure the activity of the immune system for birth to adulthood. Uh, we did this by qPCR in the intestine. We measured hundreds of, 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 uh, of genes. And what we saw is that around weaning, peaking at exactly three weeks in mice, um, there was a very strong reaction, which we call the weaning reaction, which was induced by the microbiota because in jumping mice it was completely flat. And it really looked like, it really looked like, you know, a, a whatever immune response, strong immune response you would have or develop against a bacterial infection. Uh, and, and it was bluntly just a, 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 a strong vigorous response against the bacterial invasion of the, of, of, of the gut. So we call this the, re, the, the weaning reaction. I forgot to, to tell you that why does this happen here and not here? You have actually a, a strong response just after birth, uh, during the first uh, hours of life, but then milk kind of stabilizes the system and buffers the system. And there are different things than milk, such as EGF, a epidermal growth factor, which blocks the transfer of antigens. And therefore, basically, the, the system is, is, uh, is buffered or silenced. And around that time, when the mouse starts, and the baby for that, for that matter, starts to eat more than just milk, solid food, that's why the microbiota or some elements of the microbiota have now the opportunity to expand. Uh, and actually, you, 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 you witness a 10 to 100 times expansion of the numerically of the microbiota. And that's exactly to what the immune system does react. So uh, this figure is just to show you the, um, the tsunami of genetic expression change during weaning. These, uh, uh, these are genes changing Nesclef mice, so microbiota dependent. So you can see this numerically strong shift of thousands of genes which are induced uh, during weaning by the microbiota. And something we have not explored yet, you have uh, hundreds, if not thousands of genes which are not induced by the microbiota, yet program to change, which you might expect because, of course, you know, uh, after weaning, for instance, in the intestine, uh, the physiology is going to change, the, uh, the food source is going to change, so a number of things are programmed to change, but yet there may be uh, a number of things which are interesting to investigate there. Uh, okay, so, oops, sorry. So this is a key experiment uh, Ziad did to demonstrate the existence of this uh, time window. Uh, what, uh, what you see is the uh, uh, measurement of TNF, um, classical uh, cytokine against uh, bacteria. Uh, in, in black, you have uh, the measurement of TNF in an SPF mass born with microbiota. You can see it peaks at three weeks and then recedes. And if you follow after weaning, it's flat, as I showed you. John mice, it's flat all throughout. And now in orange, what you have, what he did was jump your mice, which are colonized with uh, white time microbiota before weaning. And that induces quite a good response. But if these mice, the jump your mice, have never seen bacteria exposed to microbiota after weaning here, nothing happens anymore, which was extremely intriguing. So the time window, so we know how it opens. The milk is an essential element in the opening of the reactivity of the immune system to microbiota. But why it closes, we're not sure yet. Or let's say how it closes, we're not sure yet. So a reason if there's a time window, there must be maybe an autogenic, uh, as I said, uh, a consequence. Well, there's a consequence to perturb ontogeny. Uh, and uh, so uh, what they did was to perturb uh, the microbiota during weaning or not by exposing mice to antibiotics until weaning or during weaning or just uh, starting after weaning and then uh, uh, stopped, in, in most cases, the treatment. Mice went back to normal. Mice were, were normal, fed uh, normal water, and they looked no different from the others. They were not sick. They were perfectly healthy. And two months later, he challenged them with uh, uh, intestinal uh, uh, challenge system, uh, uh, DSS-inducing colitis. It's a chemical, an irritant. 
and uh, nothing is visible in these mice until the challenge. So when you challenge these mice, they're going to lose weight, they're going to have intestinal inflammation, and some will die. But in mice which have experienced microbiota during weaning, this death rate is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is marginal. Uh, however, those who have not seen microbiota during weaning, even though they had antibiotics before or after, uh, sorry, uh, mice which have uh, not experienced microbiota during weaning because they had antibiotics, they're much more susceptible to this challenge uh, in terms of inflammation, in terms of, uh, of survival. Uh, this is uh, rather technical, but that's to illustrate that it's across the board in terms of immune responses. Um, um, TNF and L1 beta are measuring antibacterial responses. Infant gamma is more uh, an antiviral infection uh, response. IL4, 513 is more an anti helmet, anti helmet response. But you can see that mice which have seen microbiota, they mount they respond, but those who have not seen microbiota during this time window, the response is much stronger across the board, which was quite unusual and unexpected because in general, you have one type of response blocking the other ones. It's across the board that the immune system just deregulated. And actually, we tested a number of consequences such as allergy, cancer as a consequence of chronic inflammation, and everything shows that mice are just much more susceptible to inflammation or consequences of inflammation. Um, maybe I'll just skip this. Um, so what we did was to, to, to some, just this part, was to try to understand what components of the immune system were necessary to, uh, to avoid this. Uh, what are the components of the immune system which interact with the microbiota so that you don't have these long-term negative consequences? So what we showed basically uh, was that you need bacteria. That means you need bacterial antigens to induce an antibacterial response. So far, so good. But this response has to be not, uh, uh, has to be controlled. And to control this, you need bacteria which can process food, such as dietary fibers, to make the short chain fatty acids. You need uh, vitamin A so that the body can uh, uh, generate reactic acids. And these components uh, kind of uh, restrain the antibacterial response so that you have a moderate antibacterial response. And that is what you need, what you generally do what these mice do during weaning to restrain or to, to, have, uh, to ensure uh, a normal development of the immune system and so that the immune system is not uh, an excessive response to inflammatory channels later in life. Um, so there are many components. I just show this one, this cell, but probably many other components of the immune system involved. Uh, now the, 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 the the question we are interested in is to understand the nature of that memory. Uh, because something happens here, then these mice are not anymore, need not to be exposed to, to the inducer, to the microbes. And uh, memory can, can take a long time. In mouse, we went up to four to six months. In human, in the clinics, we can go up to years, where now the kids and the mice uh, record or uh, uh, are imprinted in the response, in the amplitude of the response, the imprinted of what happened here. So what's the nature of this memory? When you talk to, to immunologists, memory has a very special meaning that is now uh, antigen-specific memory. There's a mechanism for it, but um, I also mentioned before that the, the, uh, Rick Bloomberg in Harvard showed that is an element of, uh, in, of epigenetic memory which can be involved and that's uh, that's something I think is very important. I'm going to mention a few other papers uh, later on where now epigenetic imprinting or memory is going to affect many different cells, also non-immune cells, and may be involved here. But that's something we don't know yet, which cells are really involved. Uh, and uh, that's what we are now uh, investigating. Uh, people have shown that stroma cells can, uh, can, uh, can be imprinted in life. These people have shown that 
uh, strong cells, that is fibroblasts in lymph nodes draining antigens from the guts, are somehow imprinted by microbiota or bacteria coming into the intestine early in life. And uh, these cells can then be transplanted elsewhere and we have the same propensity and ability to induce this or that type of, of cells late in life. So something is imprinted, they show just epigenetic, uh, they just show gene expression, they did not uh, discover which type of substrate encoded the memory. Uh, I mentioned for the, uh, the work of Rick Bloomberg that mild cells were involved. We have some, uh, some evidence, uh, this is the paper of uh, Rick Bloomberg. We have some elements to believe uh, also mild in, in This was just an RNA of the in, of mice which have seen microbiota or have not seen microbiota just doing weaning. And so these mice have been let alone for two months and we did some RNA seek, uh, nice colors, but uh, these nice colors just show you that uh, even though they, li they live two months together, there's a number of genes which are indeed imprinted. And that is something we have to, to sort out now, uh, uh, which genes are really relevant for this phenomenon. But they, in general, they, 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 uh, they point uh, towards the uh, involvement of mites uh, such as macrophages. Um, in that experiment, maybe I just skip this one, but we showed that the T cells I mentioned before, you just may saw them, uh, the T regs, uh, which were which are involved in kind of uh, moderating the response of the immune system against bacteria. They can uh, they can um, they can carry memory. But it's not a, a adaptive memory, a, a classical immune memory. And we, we are now uh, attacks seek, uh, seeking these experiments to understand and the hypothesis that they're, they're imprinted at the epigenetic level to try to understand which genes are involved there. Okay. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I asked more questions than I. Uh, uh, that, uh, that I, I solve questions, but uh, that's, um, that's, that's the beauty of it. Let me just introduce uh, one more concept, is the, the concept of cross-regulation in the immune uh, system, which I mentioned a few slides before. So uh, for the non immunologist type 1 responses are, are, are direct against intracellular threats, such as uh, uh, viruses or transformation of the cells. Type 3 is just the opposite. It's, again, it's uh, directly against extracellular microbes, extracellular threats. Uh, and you have type 2 responses, which are, which are very different in nature because they, uh, the response has to confront large, uh, large stuff such as helminths, which cannot destroy easily uh, with, uh, with macrophages uh, you know, uh, like viruses or bacteria. Here, the strategy is in general different. It's not. Uh, in general, not trying to destroy the virus, but uh, the, the helminths, but trying to block its entry by secreting mucus, by, uh, by making the, the tissue more, um, more uh, solid uh, with fibrosis and fluidifying the uh, surfaces. So some people suggest that this, uh, this type two immune responses are heavily constructed on repair responses, and repair responses then, uh, actually type two also leads to repairing the tissue after, after infection. What is important here is that uh, once uh, you are confronted uh, with a virus, um, because of the type of response, because of the energy, the other types of responses are blocked. This is cross-regulation. Uh, and a number of papers show this beautifully. In that paper, uh, David Artis and Skip Virgin showed that when a mouse is confronted with no virus, it deals pretty well with that particular strain if it's confronted with a particular helmet, it does pretty well, but if it sees the, the helmet and then is super infected by the virus, that does not go well for the mouse because it's engaged in a type two response, which is going to block the type one and therefore it's going to be underreactive against the virus and may die from the virus infection. In this paper from Skip, uh, uh, quite a provocative paper showing that antibiotic can be useful against viruses because the antibiotics are going to kill the bacteria, therefore decreasing the type 3 responses 
deblocking type 1 responses and making the host more efficient to combat viruses. So uh, cross-regulation is effective and important. And why am I telling you this is because uh, what I told you before is that the winning reaction, uh, as, as far as we can tell, is something which is direct against bacteria. So it's a type 2 response. And this happens to be quite important. Because when we divert the response to something else, the mice did not do well later in life. Uh, here it's just uh, it, uh, mice uh, having a high fiber diet. That's good. You know, uh, a lot of fibers. Everybody tells you it's good. It is. Mice which have not been fed early in life with uh, fibers tend to develop, or not only not fibers, but a lot of fats, tend to develop. Uh, in contrast to a type, three, a type 1 response, you can see the film uh, That's until four weeks of, uh, of life. Then you, you turn these mice to normal life with a normal food, yet they remain imprinted. Those who have seen a type 1 winning reaction do not well. They're much more susceptible, as you can see, to this challenge late in life than the green mice, which have seen, which have developed type 3 response. Even more worryingly is uh, calorie intake. These are mice which are grown with mothers, giving high fat diet. Mice which have been garbage or pups which have been garbage directly with a high fat diet. And this is, for people working with mice, is kind of uh, scary because these are mice from a small litter and these are mice from the large litter. And what you see is body weight at four weeks. So mice which have been fed with mothers which have a high fat diet tend to be fatter. Uh, of course, those fed with high fat diet are fed, and those who are growing with a small litter are fed because they have more access to milk. So they eat more and they get fatter. After four weeks, they return to a more normal life, and they return to a normal growth and normal weight pretty fast. And guess what? Two months later, when you assess their susceptibility to challenge, those who have been fed uh, early in life are more susceptible to inflammatory disease again. And the reason is, is because in that context, they might develop a type 1 response. Actually, uh, the type of nutrients, of course, is going to determine the type of microbiota. And in that context, the high fat diet, the low fiber diet, um, promotes the development of microbiota, which tends to do uh, hydrogen sulfides. And hydrogen sulfides are going to reduce the mucus and therefore make the mucus more permeable. And permeability leads to more inflammation of the intestine. And inflammation is going to feed or select some microbes, such as protobacteria, which like, uh, like salmonella, like uh, inflammation. And therefore, there's a, there's a, uh, 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 a circular causality, a circular uh, bad causality leading. Uh, the environment to the host to have this inflammatory response, which then leads uh, uh, more microbiota, leading to more permeability. And uh, that leads what we call to pathological imprinting and uh, higher susceptibility in the adult to inflammation. So I don't know about you, but you know, in the end, considering what I told you, it's a bit scary. It means, it may mean that during this time window, uh, the, narrow, the, the path to health is very narrow. Uh, you might have the impression that you know, you're know you walking on a very thin path, and uh, if there's a little bit of wind uh, going to the wrong type of immune response, the wrong type of microbiota, the wrong type of food, you're going just to fall off the cliff and, and be imprinted uh, for a very long time with the reactivity of the immune system, which leads you to inflammatory pathology. Um, yet, that's not the impression I want to give you as a, as a take-home message. Uh, I'll tell you why. This is the, uh, the graphical abstract we published in our paper. And so, uh, yes, uh, this is some of what I told before. You need bacteria, you need uh, 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 dietary fibers, vitamin to induce a, a winning reaction, which induces the right cells and inducing what we call health imprinting, and therefore low reactivity of the immune system and low susceptibility 
to pathologic inflammation, which leads to uh, to IBD, to diabetes, to autoimmunity, and maybe to uh, neurodegenerative disease. Now, when you come into antibiotics, you block this, and you lead, you go to into, you go into pathology imprinting, which means higher reactivity of the immune system, and therefore high susceptibility to all these diseases I just mentioned. Yet, I think this is a very biased view of uh, all, all I told you, because this is a view from someone living in the uh, industrial country, uh, where we are exposed mostly to uh, this lifestyle, higher levels of antibiotics early in life, excessive hygiene, which leads to uh, a lower diversity in microbiota. And therefore, we are not exposed so much to pathogens. We are uh, already exposed to the consequences of, uh, of uh, a world, an environment with uh, a low load of pathogens. And therefore, the, the, the diseases we are, uh, we, we are dealing with are inflammatory pathology. But what if now this context of pathological imprinting, there is higher activity, uh, what if now you come with pathogens, you infect these mice, since the immune system is more reactive, are you going to be more protected against, uh, against infection? This we did not test. It might mean that it's not uh, 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 green or, or red, it's, it's contextual. You have a, a reactivity of the immune system which is determined by, uh, by your early life, um, uh, early life experience with uh, exposure with microbiota, and it can induce pathogens, and and uh, and uh, this uh, reactivity might be good if you are exposed to pathogens, might be bad if you are not. But it's very contextual, and so I don't see that as red or green. I just see this as uh, as um, as a generator of diversity in the immune response, and the uh, generation of diversity in immune systems in the immune systems is very important, it's like MHC diversity. Uh, at, at the level of the population, you want to have a population with very diverse uh, um, uh, reactivity of the immune response because the context may change and you want at least uh, a significant proportion of the population being uh, uh, protected uh, from the challenge. So this is probably misleading and I just see this as a, as a generator of diversity which is good at the population level. Okay, just to finish two slides, I talked to you about the intestine because that's where we showed this, uh, we have shown this phenomenon. Imprinting can also happen in other organs. Um, in this paper from Rosenblum, as you see yourself, uh, imprinting has been shown in the skin. They showed that exposure of the skin to microbiota early life leads to moderation of the response to to, uh, to a psoriasis and, uh, and skin allergy late in life. The mechanism is not clear. This paper is really cool uh, from Ellen Fox and Shudi Naik in New York, where, sh where they showed that in the adult, uh, inflammation of the skin leads to, during certain challenge, a much stronger uh, inflammatory uh, response of the skin. And there, the, uh, the, the Shruti showed how it works. It, it's a really cool paper. It showed that epithelial cells, epithelial stem cells, modify the epigenetic, epigenetic codes of some genes which are involved in the immune uh, response. And uh, these components open uh, renewed challenge will be more expressed and therefore leading or directing a stronger immune response later. This paper shows imprinting in the bone marrow, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, the, the, uh, the challenge has been done in the lung, but uh, Ben shows that hematopoietic stem cells, at least myelid stem cells in the bone marrow, are imprinted by what happens in the lung. And this is very important because if you touch the bone marrow, the, the impact is going to be on the whole system, on the whole organism, because all the immune system is, is, uh, is generated there, as you know. Uh, this paper doesn't show uh, uh, imprinting of the uh, immune system, but uh, uh, just shows you uh, a work from Marion in my lab now that early life stress stressens uh, in terms of behavior leads to later life uh, uh, susceptibility to stress. And this is just to suggest that 
um, something we are very interested in to, to, to assess whether the nervous system, uh, uh, peripheral or central, might be imprinted at some level by the winning reaction and leading them to a systemic uh, uh, change in the regulation of the immune system. Because, you know, uh, among the, the, the best regulators of the immune system or the, um, the strongest are cortisol and uh, the adrenergic system, which are utterly efficient in blocking the immune response. And we believe that maybe these systems might be imprinted. Okay, uh, finally, uh, um, why imprinting? Uh, so you may know this experiment. This, the, imprint, the term imprinting in that context has been coined by Conrad Lawrence and his, uh, his experiments on geese. And I don't know if you know, you probably know this phenomenon. And I, I was acquainted with this when I was a kid and there was a show on BBC where a lady was uh, waiting for the geese to hatch and then she was uh, singing something or saying something. And the first sound these geese were hearing was associated with the mother. So she became their mother and therefore she could, uh, she could travel with these geese when they were you know, traveling across continents. She was flying with them and you could just follow these geese uh, to the extraordinary, extraordinary migration throughout the world. So this is imprinting in the uh, nervous system. There are many more examples. For those speaking uh, Spanish in the audience, Javier, uh, Javier you will notice will be unable, utterly unable to make the difference between B and V because he has not been imprinted during his first year of life to make the difference as a baby between B and V. Uh, we have to hear the sounds and to have, the baby has to train the sounds. And this is the of imprinting, which is very important for, for the ability to make the difference between sounds. And uh, it's, that's the reason why are, it's so difficult to, to correct uh, accents. So why imprinting for the nervous sy systems? Maybe because it's such a complex system that you you have to construct maybe bricks by bricks. You have to make the foundations, then the first floor, the second floor, and that's maybe a way to, to solve the, or to construct a complex system. And I suggest that it's maybe something similar with the immune system, that there's some blocks which have been, have to be developed early in life to be constructed, the basis on which you can then construct the first and the second floor. And I suggest that the winning reaction, for instance, is one of these early blocks on which the immune system has to construct. And therefore, that's the reason why this early encounter in microbiota is so, is so important for later life activity of the immune system. Voila, voila, this uh, having said that uh, these are my collaborators and uh, at Pasteur and, and beyond. And uh, I'm very grateful to them and very grateful to you uh, for listening to me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gérard. Um, um, yeah, I'm applauding. Yeah, clapping. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> clapping now. Um, so I saw that uh, Javier immediately reacted to your uh, uh, um, yeah suggestion about the bees and bees in terms of imprinting. So that's that was nice. So we don't have much much time. Oh, Maria says that also in Italian. Okay. <laughs> Um, we don't have much time, but I think we do have time for a few questions. Uh, who has uh, any questions for Gerard? Margaret. Gerard, thank you very much for that great talk. Um, so I just have a question about the fact that, you know, um, in mam mammals are, have a particular strategy among the vertebrates, and that is, you know, they're, they're uh, milk producing and, and so on. I'm wondering um, if any, if anything, I mean, you showed geese at the end. I'm wondering in the non-mammalian vertebrates, what kind of maturation of the immune system goes on uh, where you don't have this um, kind of weaning behavior? Is anything known about that? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, and yes, and milk. Milk, uh, milk is very important for many reasons uh, because the menu changes in that, in that phenomenon of... Uh, in the gut of imprinting. For the non-mammals, um, I'm just trying to scan my memory if anything has been shown, um, but I'm not aware. I'm not aware, I'm, I'm th trying to th think in zebrafish, if anything has been shown. Actually, 
um, someone working on the development of the immune system in the zebrafish showed how uh, a number of um, uh, reactions uh, when the fish is still a larvae uh, are developing, which are typical of antibacterial responses, but the, the, the cells making it uh, in the larvae stage is very different from the adult. Yeah. And uh, the timing is very different, of course, because you have a larvae stage. Uh, but this led us to think that maybe there was an element of imprinting there, because you, can re you could really distinguish these responses at, uh, uh, similar, but done by very different cells but responding still to, to bacteria. So we were really wondering whether this, uh, this, this change in the nature of the cells during this response was basically a reflection of what happens in the mammals. And that's yeah. something we, we, we're going to test in zebrafish. It would be interesting to know what portion of the mammalian response is conserved and what isn't conserved and what, what is specific to mammals. Yeah, interesting. At least, you know, in terms of antibacterial response, uh, uh, um, things like interleukin-22 or, you know, all this family of interleukin-22, which includes interferon, uh, interferon lambda, uh, which are very good against uh, viruses and bacteria, are, are quite conserved throughout at least the, the, um, the, uh, the vertebrates and are not necessarily done by uh, uh, immune cells. Epithelial cells can do these kind of things. So it's, it's intriguing because uh, even though the, the immune system may have developed uh, um, to, to, large ex uh, to, 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 to diversify a lot in vertebrates, the idea that non-immune cells can do this type of response may hint that maybe it's, these are very old responses and these are really the responses that I was talking about in the winning reaction. So yes, we sh you should look at, 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 at what winning means in, in squids, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> at least there's a hatching in squids. Uh, we have two questions, uh, so please, short questions. One by Gregor, one by Maria. Okay, Gregor first. Thanks a lot, Shara, for this fascinating talk. Let me ask a thing that kind of ties together what you said at the end about the contextuality of uh, pathogenicity and, and healthy. Where, to the beginning of your talk when you stress that the microbiome adds new functionality to its host. I was curious, uh, given the imprinting uh, uh, narrative at the end, if you would consider maybe there is something about the functionality of certain microbes that given into a context then will be uh, healthy or pathogenic, given on the context not of the types of microbes there, but rather if you were to classify them according to what kind of functionality they bring to the table. If you had any expression data or speculative thoughts in, in that direction, I would be curious to hear. It's, it's quite a, it's quite a, 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 a large, you know, a, a comprehensive question. What I can tell you is that uh, it's really the, uh, it's, it's, it's multifactorial. Uh, why I'm saying that is that because you can take one bacteria, which is very pro-inflammatory, and we show that it's necessary to have pro-inflammatory bacteria, but alone, they drive you in the red. And you need to have this bacteria to drive you in the red, but you need other bacteria to, to go from the red back in the green. That is, you need this pro-inflammatory bacteria, at the same time, you need this bacteria which, which, can, which can digest fibers, so that the response is modulated back in something which is is uh, is um, is okay for the for, for the young mice. Uh, but if you have only this the dietary fibers and these bacteria alone, that does not work. If you only have these bacteria, it does not work. So it's reason why I say it's multifactorial. So it's impossible to to assign a particular bacteria to a particular uh, uh, consequence on the winning reaction, which is something. We, we, we tend to do because, of course, it's easier to reduce it to a single bacteria. But, uh, you know, the pro-inflammatory bacteria, uh, like protobacteria E. coli, is a good example because they, the effect on the immune system is strong. And given the context, it drives you, drive you in the red or in the green, uh, also in the adult. Uh, we have one minute, 30 seconds for Maria's question and Gerard's uh, answer. So I'm sorry, there will not be other questions. I'm really sorry. Oh, you have to be kind to ladies. So, so what, what is, uh, Gerard, very nice 
what is the role of the milk in all of your reaction? Do you have any idea? The role what? of the milk? So yeah. the only thing we are sure of is this EGF. Mm -hmm. So eternal growth factor uh, is probably involved in the maturation of the pure cells, even though I don't know much about it. But uh, what has been shown by, uh, by Rodney Newberry is that it blocks the goblet cells' ability to, uh, to transport antigens from the lumen into the lamina propria. Mm -hmm. And this level, level of EGF at birth is very high. Then it starts to dip at two weeks in the mice. And when it's slow enough, then you can, you can transport antigens. And actually, you can just uh, inject EGF in the mice at three weeks and it blocks the reaction. So this is an element we are sure of. We are not, uh, I showed you the, f the, 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 f the, the, uh, the little size and the effect and the, therefore the effect of the milk. The milk tends to be extremely fat at birth and tends to be more sweet with time. And some have suggested that that may be important to assess. We have not assessed the, uh, the, um, the composition of the milk with time uh, and the impact of sugars or fats on the winning reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, we are perfectly on time, so I think uh, it's time to clap again. Uh, thank you very much, Gérard. Uh, that was very good and very interesting. Um, I'm now going to stop the video because, as I said, uh, Maria Reschino is, is, going, is going to present new material. So I'm... Uh, Okay, so we are back on the video and I um, just want to uh, say a few words about Rob Knight. Uh, Rob very kindly accepted to give this talk um, from San Diego. It's early in the morning. I can also see Sarkis Musmanian. Thank you Sarkis for joining us. And uh, uh, this is a real uh, pleasure to have you both uh, for these uh, Zoom talks. Uh, for lack of a better situation, which would be you all being in Bordeaux, but again, uh, it will be, uh, I don't know, next time, next year, I hope, something like that. Um, so Rob, as you know, is the uh, founding director of the Center for Microbiome Innovation. He's a professor of pediatrics and computer science and engineering at the uh, uh, University of San Diego. He's Clearly one of the best and most active researchers in the microbiome area. Uh, he has explored the role of uh, microbiome in different health conditions, including obesity and HIV and others. Uh, oh, I'm going to mute uh, people who do too much noise, but please do it yourself if you can. It's much better to mute your microphone, please, when you're not a speaker. Thank you very much. Um, and. Um, uh, yeah, Rob is a fellow of the American Association of the Advan Advancement of Science and of the American Academy of Microbiology. He received many prizes, including in 2017 the Mastery Prize. Um, he also gave an excellent uh, TED talk. I'm sure uh, several of you have watched this talk. Um, as it was uh, back in 2014. And from this talk, um, Rob wrote a book which uh, is uh, very entertaining and very good uh, called uh, entitled Follow Your Gut, The Enormous Impact of Tiny Microbes. That was in 2015. And more recently, Rob was the co-author of a book called Dirt is Good, The Advantage of Germs for Your Child's Developing Immune System. So in 2017. And um, today, Rob accepted to talk about the human microbiome and its application to cancer. Rob, the floor is yours, and thank you again for accepting the invitation. All right, uh, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Thomas, for that uh, very kind and comprehensive in, uh, in, uh, um, introduction, and also for the invitation to do this. And uh, I wish we were following through the uh, original plan to do it in person in Bordeaux. Um, uh, it is nice anyway to have a brief uh, respite from the calls preceding this and immediately following it, which are about COVID-19, um, because uh, as, the, uh, as, uh, as, as was the theme of the uh, board meeting at the Moore's Cancer Center uh, a few weeks ago, uh, despite COVID, uh, cancer continues to be with us, and we need to remember about all these uh, other diseases uh, beyond, uh, beyond COVID-19 that are uh, ongoing and continuing threats to human health. 
So, uh, so as, as you requested, I'm going to give an over, uh, a brief overview of the human microbiome in general, um, then talk about uh, what we are doing uh, recently and applying it to cancer, and uh, then what, uh, what, what our aspirational goal for the future of uh, application of this human microbiome research is going to be. I'd like to begin by asking you to consider what you saw when you looked in the mirror this morning. Uh, for myself, I saw an organism that's just 43% human, and not just because it was early and I hadn't had my coffee yet, but uh, when we think of what makes up our bodies in terms of the cell level, each of us has about 30 trillion human cells, but we have about 39 trillion microbial cells, and that's where that 43% human number comes from. Now you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, it's the 21st century, do we really care about counting cells anymore? Uh, let's think about this in terms of DNA. So let's think about that for a moment. Each of us has about 20,000 human genes, depending on what exactly you count as a gene. But astonishingly, the size of our microbial gene catalog is somewhere between two and 20 million microbial genes. So by that measure, we're only about 1% human at best, right? And so what's shocking is that we're ignoring 99% of our genes when we focus only on the germline human genome. But what's more is that the 99% of our genes that we're ignoring are the 99% that we can change and have changed profoundly during our lifetimes, during the process of development, and could potentially take control over uh, through lifestyle factors, through diet, through drugs, and so on, uh, to modify our health throughout our lifetime. Now, uh, the microbiome affects uh, responses to a huge number of drugs, including painkillers like acetaminophen, uh, anti-cancer drugs like digoxin, cyclophosphamide, even the latest checkpoint inhibitors. And whether these therapies will work for you and whether they're safe for you depends tremendously on your gut microbiome. Um, and uh, in, in 2018, three papers came out in the same issue of Science showing that whether or not uh, anti-PD-1 uh, 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 um, uh, checkpoint inhibitor ther uh, therapy was effective depended on the microbiome, and that you could even transplant this effectiveness from humans into mice by transplanting the gut microbiome uh, by our fecal transplant from humans to germ-free mice, uh, conferring the uh, individual patients um, uh, ability to be treated or inability to be treated with anti-PV-1 uh, anti checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And so this sort of experiment is very useful for establishing causality, showing that the microbiome is not just associated with some trait, but uh, that a change in the microbiome can be causal for that trait. And uh, we're also finding out a lot about uh, the connections between the microbiome and the rest of the body. Um, so the microbiome is connected to uh, diseases that affect, through, uh, affect, uh, um, affect things throughout the body, including cardiovascular disease, uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, even things like autism. Um, and uh, I think Sarkis is going to talk about Parkinson's disease next. So, um, so I won't go too much into this, except to say that many individual mechanisms of connection between the gut and the brain have now been worked out. So in just a decade, we've gone from asking how could the gut and the brain even be connected to each other to which of half a dozen mechanisms is acting in a particular case where there's a gut, you know, where there's a gut brain connection. And is it one mechanism like say release of metabolites or signaling through the vagus nerve or whatever, or is it a combination of these different, uh, different mechanisms? that are now getting well worked out. Uh, so, um, so the Human Microbiome Project, uh, which I was involved in in several capacities, and was an amazing team of hundreds of researchers across the United States and across the world, uh, was one of the first large-scale efforts to characterize the human microbiome. And um, the project overall spent about $173 million. The largest component of this was the baseline uh, healthy human study, um, where in the initial papers in Nature, uh, we looked at, um, in 2012, we looked at 242 people characterized at up to 18 sites on the body, which as you can imagine is a lot of places to stick a Q-tip. And then they were sampled at up to three time points to get a sense of change over time. And, four, uh, and we collected four and a half trillion bases of DNA. So, um, so the great thing about this project was that we had an unprecedented amount of DNA sequence data concerning the human microbiome. Uh, you could argue that that was also the terrible thing about the project. And to illustrate the problem that we faced, this is the first file of data from the Human Microbiome Project. And actually, this is just the first 0.1% of this file. There's another 17,000 files just like it, uh, just in the 16S ribosomal RNA marker gene component of the project. And uh, that's just a tiny fraction of the data when you compare it to the shotgun metagenomic data. 
And despite the fact that what we're doing is fundamentally ecology, uh, it's pretty hard to tell who lives where in the environment from that, right? You probably can't even tell that's an oral sample, let alone the sequence signatures that would let us determine it, uh, determine that by matching it up to uh, sequences from other organisms and environments. And this is a problem now, not just for research, uh, but clinically, because there's more and more companies, um, and uh, as well as um, as well as, as well as uh, open source projects like the MicroZeta uh, initiative that uh, that we run out in my lab. Um, but uh, there's more and more ways that uh, that as an individual, uh, you can get a readout of your own microbiome. And I have to tell you that it's your physician's nightmare that they're going to come to you, um, that, that you're going to show up in their office with a huge grin on your face and tell them, hey doc, I have some great news for you, which is I had my microbiome done. And now I have this list of a thousand species that they found in my gut. And with all this data, you can tell me what's wrong with me, right? And I mean, what's your, what's your doctor going to do? Refer you to colleagues in psychiatry for being crazy enough to think that they can do something with that? And so uh, our goal as a lab has been very much to make it not crazy anymore, to think that you could do something with this kind of complex uh, data about the microbiome, uh, but instead integrate it with profiles from other people, um, maybe profiles uh, from yourself over time, so that, you can, um, so that you can get an understanding of what's going on. Uh, I won't talk too much about the computational tools, but basically using Chime, uh, which is a pipeline that we introduced in 2010, led by Greg Caparese, uh, then a postdoc in my lab, and now, uh, now a professor at NAU, um, we could turn all of that data into this map uh, at the whole microbiome sample level of how microbiomes were organized across the body. So uh, each point on this map represents all of the complexity of a microbiome, distilled just down to one point by a dimensionality reduction technique or principal coordinates analysis and using a distance metric called, um, called Unifrac that Kathy Lozapan and I introduced in 2005, uh, where we use evolutionary history to measure the distance between samples. So basically two points are close together on this map if they, ha if they share their evolutionary history, and they're further apart on this map if they have more dissimilar evolutionary history. Now remember these are healthy people, so there's no disease on this map, but you can certainly see patterns and if I color by the main thing going on, uh, it's very obvious what's going on in the data, which is the different parts of the body, uh, the mouth in green, the stool in blue, uh, the vagina in, uh, in pink, and the fecal samples in brown, uh, emerge as being very different from one another, almost like different continent, continents on this map. And uh, to highlight this, uh, if I show you um, with these yellow dots, the mouth and the gut, and the first person in the Human Microbiome Project, uh, you see that those points are very different from the rest of the points. And um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, you see those, uh, those, those two points are very far apart from each other and clustering with the rest of the mouth and the gut samples uh, respectively. But it wasn't until we did the Earth Microbiome Project um, where we crowdsourced tens of thousands of, of samples from different environments from around the planet that we really understood what those differences meant. Because what we could do is we could have a scale for these dissimilarities in microbial communities by asking what two points on the planet are just as different from one another as the mouth and the gut of this one individual in the Human Microbiome Project. And the results of this were fascinating. So if you think of your mouth as being kind of like a coral reef with complex mineralized structures covered with biofilms that maybe your dentist pesters you about from time to time, the amazing fact is your mouth is as far from, the, from your gut in terms of its microbiome ecology as the water in this reef is from the dirt in this prairie. And we never expected that, right? That a few meters along the GI tract of one human body can make as much of a difference to your microbes as thousands of kilometers across the Earth's surface. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, life is almost entirely microbial. Um, and uh, when, we look at, when we look across the planet, um, microbes account for about 90% of the history of life on Earth and the vast majority of genetic diversity on Earth. And they've adapted to live among the most extreme environments uh, on Earth, many of which we've studied through the Earth Microbiome Project, including hydrothermal vents, the Atacama Desert, hot springs in Yellowstone, and so on. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, this is also true uh, in terms of the human body. So uh, microbes account for the majority of uh, cells and the majority of genetic content in, uh, um, in and on our human bodies. So uh, when, when we come to think about cancer, uh, typically people uh, think of cancer as a sterile entity. But what I'm going to argue is that um, what, what I'm going to argue is that uh, this view is wrong, and uh, this classic paper by uh, by um, uh, by by Robert Weinberg 
on the hallmarks of cancer, uh, which has been cited thousands and thousands of times, uh, and uh, includes a whole lot of um, includes a whole lot of uh, what are thought of as signature features of cancer. But all but all of these features omit the microbiome entirely. So, um, so uh, all of this work that's gone into understanding the hallmarks of cancer from a host perspective uh, hasn't really helped with pancreatic cancer very much. And so um, if you look at the uh, five-year survival data, um, uh, Greg Poor, who's a very talented uh, MD-PhD student in my lab, um, put this and the other uh, slides on cancer together. Uh, between the 1970s and when his grandmother died in, um, in, in 2012, uh, all of that research had led to only about an eight and a half percent improvement in survival uh, at five years for pancreatic cancer, which his grandmother died of. And uh, th this is Greg. He's uh, been doing truly groundbreaking work at the intersection of medicine and uh, AI, uh, as you'll see, uh, to be able to, um, to to be able to get a handle on uh, not just the pancreatic cancer that killed his grandmother, but uh, all cancers, um, but, but all cancers as a class. And um, one thing that caught Greg's attention was this paper in, in 2017 um, showing by microscopy uh, that, uh, pancreat uh, that pancreat uh, pancreatic cancers uh, contain microbes. Um, so what, what you're seeing here is, um, uh, what you're seeing here in blue is the large host cells uh, that are the pancreatic cancer themselves. And then in red, what you're seeing is bacteria that can break down chemotherapeutic agents, where if those bacteria are inside the tumor, the tumor is able to resist chemotherapy. And uh, what was fascinating about this paper is that three quarters of, uh, of, of patients had uh, had bacteria in their can in, in, in their uh, in their cancer biopsies. Um, uh, subsequent to this, uh, the, there's been uh, evidence that bacteria can have a big impact on uh, patient survival. And so, um, and, and so, uh, and, and so, um, in, in another paper in Cell, um, uh, what what you're seeing here is long-term survival. Uh, based on whether there's bacteria uh, inside the pancreatic cancer or not, and so what you can see is uh, what, what you can see is a difference of ten years that's predictable uh, depending on particular um, uh, particular uh, microbial signals, and so um, and this was reproducible across uh, different cohorts uh, between MD Anderson, uh, Anderson and John uh, and Johns Hopkins, suggesting that what we were seeing uh, sorry uh, suggesting that what these researchers were seeing was a general and reproducible signal that you could do uh, across different cohorts. So um, what this indicates is that failing to examine cancer through a microbial lens is harming patient outcome because if you get very poor stratification using all of these molecular signals very expensively up to and including sequencing the entire genome of the cancer and you have limited risk stratification but if instead you use the microbiome you could get much better risk stratification and much better guidance for treatment what that suggests is that ignoring these, uh, these signals in cancer uh, could be a huge problem clinically. So, um, so as, as I mentioned before, uh, life on the planet, including all kinds of extreme environments, is clearly microbial, but, uh, uh, but this emerging evidence that cancer is not. And so, um, so, so for example, um, uh, that this is another paper that came out in Science three years ago, uh, showing electron micrographs of, of colon cancer cells, and every arrow was pointing to bacteria inside the cells. And, um, and, and these bacteria uh, moved uh, together with metastases to the liver. So, uh, so essentially the tumor cells were carrying around their own microbiomes with them and going to distal sites. And uh, uh, these were found in 40% of patient biopsies. Uh, what, what's fascinating is that we've known this for a long time. So uh, since the 1970s, um, uh, so, so since the 1970s, uh, microbes like Streptococcus uh, bovis have been associated with, uh, with, with carcinoma and uh, with bacteriemia, so bacteria circulating in the blood. And uh, so, so fascinatingly, um, although, uh, although this has been known for a long time, it's been treated as a one-off observation rather than something that might be general about the link between microbiology and cancer. So then the question is, uh, you know, what about uh, all of these other human cancers? Uh, why should we be so sure that they're sterile when examples like colon cancer, like pancreatic cancer that I showed you before, uh, are definitely not sterile? Uh, why, would we, why would we expect the rest of cancer to be sterile? Wouldn't that in fact be an astonishing hypothesis that uh, microbes that have colonized all extreme areas of the earth can only colonize a small subset of human tumor tissues? 
Um, so, uh, so this year, uh, two very large scale proofs of the concept that cancer is not sterile were published. So uh, Greg's paper came out in, uh, in, in Nature in April, um, and, and then uh, uh, then Ravid Strassman, um, uh, Ravid Strassman's lab had a very nice paper uh, following it a couple of months later in Science, which made the which which made the cover. And I'm going to focus on on Greg's work here, although the work from Ravid's lab is also extremely elegant and uh, uses microscopy to confirm that the tumours are in the in the cancer by direct uh, visual inspection. So you don't need to worry about the indirect evidence from DNA sequencing. Uh, but what we did is we used DNA sequencing, and so uh, we provided the largest scale proof of concept that cancer is not sterile using TCGA, uh, the Cancer Genome Atlas, which is this large community resource um, for, uh, uh, for, um, uh, for uh, tumor samples. So uh, basically we looked at samples from, um, from over 11,000 patients, uh, seven, different data, uh, seven, uh, seven different data types, uh, 33 different tumor types, and over two and a half petabytes of data. So, uh, this, uh, so, um, so, so to put this in perspective, uh, what we're talking about, um, uh, like one petabyte of data is 212,000 DVDs. So what we're talking about is about 500,000 DVDs worth of data uh, that we analyzed on the Seven Bridges Cloud uh, because we couldn't transfer it locally. Uh, this gives you an overview of uh, the microbial detection pipeline that Greg put together, uh, where the idea is that um, unlike traditional studies of cancer, where you focus, um, where, where, where you uh, where, where you focus exclusively on the uh, cancer genome and the sequences that align to human reference, uh, we just threw all those away and focused on what did not align to the human reference, um, and then we matched that up to a custom microbial database uh, put together by Q and Chu in my lab. Um, uh, found, uh, got, uh, got tax on assignments at the genus level uh, and then transformed the data. So uh, one really key advance that Greg made, as I'll show you in a couple of slides, is batch correction, which uh, turned the signal from being mostly technical features of how different uh, centers collected the samples and how different labs did the processing to uh, biological signatures that we could interpret in terms of cancer. Uh, and then Greg used source tracking and uh, machine learning to um, understand what was going on with microbial signatures. So, um, so one thing that was interesting about this is that we uh, saw consistently um, significant amounts of microbial reads uh, across different tumor types. So this is just showing you the different tumor types and what we see is from about 0.1% uh, up to about 4% of all of the reads in the cancer being microbial uh, rather than being human. And this is matching to identifiable microbes rather than just being unclassified. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the key data science advance that Greg made uh, was, con uh, was correcting for technical variation. So when we just plotted the uncorrected data, which is what you're seeing on the left, uh, what you can see is that basically it clusters by sequencing center and clinical site, uh, which is very annoying. Whereas uh, after batch correction, um, what you can see is that the sequencing site signal is completely detrended, which means that we can use the biological signal that's left over uh, to understand what's going on with tumors and with microbes directly, rather than seeing artifacts of how the sequencing was done in different places. And um, the uh, overall machine learning framework for discriminating, um, for, for discriminating signals in different cancers, uh, basically the signal patterns are very subtle and uh, tend to include tens to thousands of microbes. So this is one of those situations where human intelligence fails and you really need to change, uh, you really need to use artificial intelligence uh, to figure it out. So, um, so we used a technique called boosting to uh, upsample the minority classes and uh, to, uh, to split between test, um, uh, test and validation sets uh, to get a final tuned model uh, that we could then use to produce uh, uh, standard, uh, standard outputs of machine learning like receiver operator characteristic curves, precision re uh, recall curves, uh, confusion matrices, and then ranked microbial features so we could tell which microbes were contributing to each of these signals. Um, so this gives you some representative um, uh, uh, classifier performance numbers uh, within and between different cancers. And so, um, so for example, uh, ovarian cancer versus all other, uh, all other types and tumor and primary tumor tissues, uh, we're able to get an area under the rock curve of uh, 0.9956, which is, which is pretty impressive really, and an area under the precision recall curve of 0.97, uh, which is also very good. And you can see similar things for breast cancer and other uh, prevalent tumor types. 
Uh, but then the question was, could we only do this from the historical data or could we, uh, could, we, could we really get it to work on new samples? And so we collaborated with Sandy Patel at the Moore's Cancer Center at UC San Diego uh, and uh, with Andy Lowy, who's also there to get some new biological specimens uh, where, we could, um, uh, where, where, we could, uh, where we could sequence the sequence of DNA. And uh, the really exciting, um, the, the really exciting thing was to do this not just from the tumors themselves, but also from blood samples, where uh, the idea was that the tumors are amplifying bacteria and releasing um, uh, and, and viruses, and then releasing their lysed products, including DNA that we can detect uh, into the bloodstream, uh, where we can then detect it from the blood, not needing a biopsy of the tumor itself. And so we used TCGA to to power the study, uh, basically by subsampling from TCGA and asking uh, how many samples per group would we need in order to be able to have a good chance of seeing a difference if the signal was as strong as in TCGA. And uh, what, we, um, what we calculated was we needed about 15 samples per cancer type uh, for good classifier accuracy on the basis of these simulations. So, um, so then, uh, again, to uh, take a very um, uh, long story and cut it short, uh, what we got was excellent performance on lung cancer, uh, which, which is consistent with what we saw in TCGA, uh, where, um, where, where again, we're able to uh, detect from a liquid biopsy um, uh, whether, whether, whether or not someone has lung cancer. Uh, it did not work very well for melanoma, and that was an interesting observation because melanoma also did, uh, was, a, was the poorest performer in the classifiers from the TCGA data. So we think there may be something, about speci uh, something special about melanoma in terms of not picking up a unique and characteristic microbiome and uh, investigating the tumor-specific signatures is where we're going next with this. Uh, for full disclosure, I should mention that uh, Greg and uh, Sandra Miller Montgomery, uh, who was the director of the Center for Microbiome Innovation, but uh, is, um, is, is, is leaving for this, uh, this, this startup, and I uh, founded a company called Micronoma um, that's uh, commercializing this technology and uh, seeks to make it available as a diagnostic. So, um, so this, this fits into the broader aims of my lab to uh, take microbiome patterns and uh, turn them into signals that are useful. And uh, I'm sure many of you have seen this before, but it's still the best demonstration we have about why you care where you are in the microbiome map. And what we're using is uh, the example of Clostridium difficile infection, where you can see that these, uh, the, these stars, um, they're fecal samples, but they look nothing like a healthy fecal sample, which is that region down, at the brown, uh, down in brown at the bottom. And uh, what these are is from C. diff patients who are profoundly sick. So um, then when we look at fecal transplant, which we did with Mike Sadowski and Alex Grutz at the University of Minnesota, uh, four of these patients are going to get a fecal transplant from one donor who, as you can see, is in the healthy range at the bottom. And uh, what you can see is, uh, um, and so if you're wondering what a fecal transplant is, this is Bill Sanborn, who's our chair of GI, about to deliver one using hospital grade stool that he got from a nonprofit called Open Biome, because the FDA still regulates stool as a drug. Um, and so you have to uh, show that you made an effort to get it from uh, GMP procedures. But, uh, but anyway, four of these patients are going to get a stool transplant from that one donor uh, at the bottom. And uh, each frame in this animation uh, is, is one day in the lives of these, um, of, of these, um, of, of these uh, C. diff patients uh, after, after fecal transplant. So the question is, how completely does their microbiome reset to that healthy region uh, down at the bottom? and how long does that reset take? And so what you can see is uh, um, on fecal transplant, and each frame in this is a day, uh, basically immediately, like within two or three days, all of their microbiomes completely reset into the healthy state uh, as defined by the Human Microbiome Project Healthy Cohort. And you can see that they stay there during months of follow-up. And what's remarkable is that their clinical symptoms are gone in those two or three days. So fecal transplant uh, not only resets your whole microbiome at an ecological level, as you can see very clearly uh, in, in, this, um, in, in this visualization, but uh, on top of that, it's very effective for eliminating clinical symptoms of C. diff. And so uh, the, the question now is for what other diseases are we going to be able to uh, come up with microbiome-directed therapies, where the idea is to take people who are sick and their microbiome is wrong, and then guide them into health where their microbiome is correct. And so the idea is that for all these different conditions linked to the microbiome, uh, Parkinson's, which Cyclist is going to talk about next, uh, autism, arthritis, uh, cancer, obesity, IBD, uh, how can we uh, find the good and the bad places on the map to tell you what diseases you're most at risk for? 
but also how can we uh, go beyond that and develop a kind of microbiome GPS that tells you not just where am I right now, but where do I need to go in terms of what do I do step by step to reshape my microbiome, whether it's through something as extreme as fecal transplant or something as gentle as diet, which we've seen in the American Gut Project and MicroZeta uh, over the long term, having a huge impact on the microbiome and on health, although there's no quick, uh, there's no quick fixes when it comes to diet. So the idea is to develop this kind of microbiome GPS and make it so easy to use that even our kids can use it. So you could imagine a smart toilet where as soon as you flush, you get some sort of instant readout um, of, of your microbiome uh, on your smartphone, which let's face it, I bet you're using in there anyway. And uh, when, um, uh, when, when, my, uh, when my daughter was two, uh, when we took this photo, uh, she not only figured out how to use a smartphone, but also where we uh, ought to frequently use them. Um, and uh, back then, we couldn't do these kinds of displays on a phone, but today we can. For example, uh, this is her own microbiome developing from birth over the first two and a half years of her life uh, towards the adult state. And uh, this is the kind of thing that you can explain um, to an eight-year-old given enough time and patience about how their microbiome is developing and what are the good places, what are the bad places. Uh, what we're hoping is that we can turn this into the kind of thing that we can, um, that, that we can uh, have a busy clinician explain in their very short visits with their patients uh, to guide them uh, towards microbiome health over a lifetime. Um, but uh, what we'd really like to do is get this technology out of the realm of uh, labs with multi-million dollar instruments um, and, into, um, and, and perhaps even into your home. So uh, this is really the science fiction part of the talk, but the dream with this is that perhaps you can make a smart mirror where as you breathe on that mirror, your breath is whisked away through an instant uh, metabolite analysis. Um, obviously, we're still uh, working on the user interface for this because this probably uh, isn't what you want to see first thing in the morning unless you really love organic chemistry. Uh, but the idea is to take those chemical profiles, turn them into a microbiome profile like you would get from American Gut, uh, and then put you on the microbiome map uh, based on those profiles from many healthy people and many sick people, where the idea is that we could flag any disease that you're at risk of and then give you hints about how you can guide it back into health, uh, either, um, either telling you to consult a physician or giving you ideas about, um, you know, or, or giving you ideas about things that you can do yourself at home. And uh, while, while we're dreaming, you can imagine that uh, when you're in the supermarket and you're confronted with a thousand kinds of yogurt, uh, maybe, um, maybe you can use augmented reality to zoom in on the particular product that has the microbes or the metabolites you need, and then scan it with your smartphone to confirm that you got it. Uh, and then um, you could have your phone communicate back with your mirror about what you did during the day that affects your microbiome, all sorts of things like how many steps you took, how many minutes you spent outdoors, which we've shown has a strong significant effect on the microbiome, uh, what you ate, who you associated with, uh, all of these different kinds of things. And then your mirror could modify your image in real time to show you visions of yourself five, 10, 20 years down the track if you behaved every day like you behave today or what you might look like if you did better or you did worse on these different metrics. And so that probably, uh, that, that probably sounds like, um, like, like a joke, uh, but we're literally working uh, to build this kind of system in the Center for Microbiome Innovation that I direct at UC San Diego. Uh, we're with a growing list of corporate partners and over 140 faculty members. Uh, we're, bringing together, um, we're bringing together the expertise uh, to do these kinds of things, um, including things like predicting your age from your microbiome, looking at residuals correlated with, my, uh, with lifestyle factors, and then editing video images in real time to do the kind of, uh, kinds of things that I'm showing you there, as well as building the mass spec instrumentation that would let you do the readouts. Uh, so with that, um, I'd like to thank a very large number of people in my lab and collaborators, uh, literally over, over a thousand across the different projects that I've mentioned, but uh, many of whom I've, uh, um, many of, uh, of whom I've uh, mentioned in the talk. Uh, I'd also like to thank our many sources of funding, including the tens of thousands of members of the general public who have contributed to American Gut or uh, other projects under the MicroCenter Initiative umbrella. And uh, finally, I'd like to uh, thank you again for the invitation to talk here uh, and for listening. Um, I'd be delighted to answer any questions you have at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. That was fantastic. Uh, let's see um, if we already have questions. We do uh, for the little. Hi, Rob. Um, is there any reason to believe that there's any selection on bacteria to be involved in tumor formation? I mean, I guess it's sort of a dead end for them, so 
probably not, although you'd think that we might be recurring selection each time, a person, you know, each time for each patient. Yeah, that, that's, that's a very perceptive question and exactly where Greg wants to go next. So basically right now, uh, right, right now we have the idea, but no data that directly addresses that. Um, it's certainly very plausible that you'd have enough bacterial, uh, uh, bacterial generations to see uh, evolution within the tumor tissue themselves. And uh, you'd also expect to see differences between colonizers and spreaders, uh, especially once you get to especially once you get to metastatic cancer, where there might be uh, evolutionary trade-offs of, of the same kind that we see in other patch dynamics situations. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily bet that they're all a dead end either. So uh, some of the some of the bacteria that specifically target uh, cancer, like E. coli and Salmonella, um, are also bacteria that can live in the environment. So uh, horrifying though it is, maybe part of their explicit strategy to uh, get into the tumors, uh, kill the host, and then get into the environment and find another host. Although it seems like a much less efficient, a much less efficient way of doing it than inducing diarrhea. You think that would work quite well in an infectious cancer like uh, Tasmanian devil disease or something like that, but. Yeah, well, well that, that's, a very, uh, that, that's a very different story where it's the, uh, the, the altered host genome uh, itself that's uh, transmissible as a tumor. But, but that, the bacteria, uh, bacteria might cause that. Right, well, that, that's a very interesting concept. And, and also, it may have bacteria or viruses that, carry, that it carries along with it that are necessary for infection or that help it with infection. So uh, I, I, think, I think there's a lot of areas that would, be, uh, that, that would be interesting to look at. There's also that transmissible cancer in dogs, which is thought to be the last surviving example of uh, one of the most ancient dog lineages, where, uh, again, it would be very interesting to know if that's... One really uh, big dog, yes. Yeah. Thanks. Anyway, great, uh, great suggestion. And... Uh, um, uh, the, the, other, the other thing that we think is very interesting and that we're starting to pursue with um, Ludmilla Alexandrov is are there particular mutational spectra, um, both of the, of, of the cancer genome and of the bac bacteria and viruses that inhabit it that uh, depend on that interaction. So uh, they're producing all kinds of things that damage DNA, but also all kinds of different repair enzymes. Yep. Gérard Hébert. Yeah, thank you for this cool, uh, the cool seminar and the uh, and the the perspective on on science fiction. And it's probably not not so much uh, fiction anymore. But uh, my question is about you know the contextuality of good and bad microbiota, because you know we have seen we have seen in mouse experiments and that you know uh, certain microbes would be involved or would be responsible for inflammatory disease. But depend, depending on the context, would then turn into friends because you need this information. So now you have your kid on, on the stools and you have this, this graph on your phone and says, oh, you're drifting towards you know, this bad area. But that's going to depend on the individual background, genetic background, right? And also probably on the life history. So I guess to have this really functioning, you need uh, the genetic the genetic data and history data of that, that individual. Um, well, that, that's a very that's that's a very plausible suggestion. Although we've done a lot of studies of the interaction of host genetics and the microbiome, uh, as as have other people, like for example, uh, Iran Segal at the Weizmann Institute. And uh, what what we um, what what we see is that uh, host genetics has a very small effect on the microbiome itself and on a lot of the traits that uh, that the microbiome affects. So we think that to a first and maybe even to a second approximation. Um, you can just ignore the host genome, although uh, certainly for colonization of particular strains, uh, the host genome is very important, but for higher level features of the microbiome overall, uh, we, we just don't see evidence for that uh, compared, to, compared to, for example, diet. Um, lifestyle factors, that, that's a really interesting question because, um, because there's a lot of interest in, uh, in the concept of, is there an optimal microbiome? And if the microbiome is optimal, uh, does that optimal microbiome depend on you um, according to uh, some essence of you as an individual, like, for example, uh, your own DNA, or uh, does it depend on environmental factors? So maybe microbiome X is really good if you have diet A, but it's horrible if you have diet B. And so uh, understanding what needs to be included in the model for prognosis, I think, is going to be really important. Um, now, that, that said, the, um, the, the AUCs that we get for classification for a whole range of different things, including things like, um, uh, like liver disease and uh, rheumatoid arthritis and so on, are very good even if you solely use the microbiome 
and throw away all of the host factors. But uh, unless you have a longitudinal study or you have ideally an intervention study, you don't know what's cause and what's effect. So maybe there's something that predisposes you both to having an altered microbiome and also uh, to developing the disease. But if you fix the microbiome, it wouldn't do anything about the disease because it's a side effect of some underlying condition. And that's, that's the kind of thing we worry about all the time. Um, I, I think Paul Griffiths talked about uh, the work that he's doing on causal specificity at uh, one, one of these meetings recently. And uh, those ideas about how can we achieve causal specificity with the kinds of data that we can collect in microbiome studies. Um, that's, uh, that, that, that's, very, that, that, that's very interesting in terms of sifting through all of these signals and finding out not just the ones that let you diagnose a condition, but uh, find the ones that allow you to change that condition going forward. Do you know, the, the, the first line of my question and what you, what you answered is, I was going to do the way around. Uh, it's clear that the host genetics doesn't differ so much the microbiota, but you know, uh, I guess one type of microbiota can be good or bad depending on the context. I'm just referring to mouse experiments where you have this, for example, I said B, which would push a mouse to, to arthritis if it's that background, but would, 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 bene would, would benefit the host if you super infect with, with, with another bacteria. So depending on the context, then, you know, uh, it can be good or bad uh, to have this microbiota. Yes, that, that, that's certainly true. And there are certainly examples. And I, um, I, I think Sarkis may talk about some of these with BFRAGE where exactly the same strain can be a pathogen or uh, can be beneficial depending, depending on context. Um, the, uh, the, the problem with biology, as you know, is that uh, if you look at enough examples, you can always find one example where whatever you want happens. And uh, then it becomes much more of an argument about generality. So, um, so uh, what, 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 we're, what we're hoping is true is that it's generally the case that uh, a particular pattern of microbes is diagnostic either uh, for a state of the body right now or predictive of that state without needing to take too many of those context cues into account because uh, because um, that, that way you know that way we don't have to solve the SAT problem to uh, figure out what particular combination of factors is is, uh, is involved in every situation um, uh, but uh, but on the uh, but uh, on the other hand as you say uh, it may be the case that there's a lot of these stories where you can't tell from the micro from the microbes uh, alone and added linearly. You need a lot more context, um, and if that turns out to be true, then uh, that, then this kind of bio, no, biomarker prediction exercise won't work. Um, however, we're taking the success of that research paradigm uh, to date to indicate that it does have a lot of potential, even though there are going to be limitations. Can I just add something? Um, I guess, you know, in, in, in your talk and the talk before, we were considering, you know, cancer, we were considering probably inflammatory disease, uh, which are the diseases of the industrial world. But if you put, put this uh, uh, different context in, you know, uh, infection, uh, you might have very different uh, uh, perspective on, on this or that type of microbiota. I'm just uh, uh, saying that the group of disease you're looking at and most of us looking at our disease of, of the rich countries, which is inflammatory disease, basically. And uh, the same microbiota might act dif very differently if you put that in the context of, uh, of infection. Yeah, so, um, so I agree completely that, uh, that, that research on infection shows a lot of, um, a lot of uh, exquisite specificity between individual strains of bacteria and viruses and uh, host genotype and host physiological state. Um, and so, uh, so if, if you're taking an infection model, you're completely used to, uh, you know, the strain that you have will infect, say, C57 black mice, uh, um, but, but will not infect uh, Swiss Webster and uh, all, all of that kind of thing. Um, the, reason, the reason we think that paradigm, so, so the reason we think that paradigm is less useful when you look at the whole microbiome is from studies like the work we did with Jake Lucis a while ago, looking at 50 strains of mice on two different diets and just asking uh, what has more of an impact, the diet or the host genetics. And uh, Jake was convinced that it was going to be the host genetics. And then it turned out that we got two beautiful clusters by diet and you couldn't even see relationships where the genotype, where the host genotype was in those two clusters. So, um, so, so I, agree. I, I agree with you that conceptually and also um, empirically in the particular cases of infectious disease, it's very important to uh, look at the fit between the strain and the host 
uh, we, we are seeing that much less in chronic disease. And we also think that if you change from um, asking, can this one strain of a pathogen infect this animal now to uh, susceptibility, uh, that the susceptibility is going to look much more like the chronic disease paradigm than like the infectious disease paradigm where it's modified by the whole microbiome pattern overall. All right, thank you. I have a short question, and then I see that Sarkis Mismanian has a question. My question is very short. Um, it's about uh, correcting the microbiome in the case of cancer. Uh, if it just happens that uh, the bad microbiome, so to speak, causes my cancer when I'm 20, and the cancer really appears when I'm 45 or 50, uh, is it still possible to imagine correcting the microbiome in that, you know, in that context? Great question. So, I mean, it's possible to imagine it, but it might not work because the, the, the damage is too far gone. And um, a, good, a good analogy is, uh, is in liver disease, where there's a microbiome, uh, uh, there's microbiome based progression from either non-alcoholic or alcoholic fatty liver disease um, through, uh, through uh, steatohepatosis, through, uh, through cirrhosis. However, um, so you, you might say that you have the wrong microbiome and your liver gets so damaged in cirrhosis, then there's nothing you can do. But there are reports of fecal transplant for cirrhosis that substantially improves survival in human, um, in, in human patients. So um, it's not completely out of the question that even after the damage is done, that some of that damage may be reversible, uh, even, though, uh, even though, as you say, uh, at some point the damage is irreversible, like no one believes that microbes are gonna bring you back from the dead, right? So that provides a logical endpoint for, uh, for, for how much you could hope to achieve. Um, the, uh, um, in, in, terms of, um, in, in terms of reversal, so there have already been studies, uh, so, so two types of studies have been done. So one is administ administering antibiotics to cancer patients and then finding that uh, chemotherapeutic agents are less effective when they don't have their normal microbiome because it's been wiped out by antibiotics. Uh, the other has been by administering antibiotics that specifically target uh, bacteria that are in the tumors and uh, that are known to detoxify drugs. And those targeted antibiotic therapies have in some cases been very helpful as, an, uh, as, as a complementary strategy to chemotherapy or immunotherapy. So um, I think it's gonna be like the rest of oncology, very much, uh, very much um, specifics of what you can do in particular cases and particular subtypes of disease. Um, but uh, given that all of oncology seems to be going towards this precision medicine approach, I don't think that's necessarily a problem that you're going to need to find out more about the patient, more about the tumor, and more about the bacteria to be able to come up with a tightly targeted approach. Although uh, from, a, from an ethics perspective, it is hideously expensive and uh, exacerbates health disparities if you can only take uh, this approach that takes a huge amount of molecular work and a whole lot of specialized knowledge. Very hard to uh, deploy that in large populations, um, especially large lower income populations. Thank you, Salkis. Uh, hi, Ralph. Uh, first of all, I'm gratified, gratified to see you've taken the path of least resistance with your hair. Absolutely. Uh, uh, hairdressing <laughs> in a pandemic is a terrible idea, as you know, uh, but you've been ahead of the curve on that. <laughs> 20 years ahead of it. Um, well, quite a visionary uh, you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had to step out, so I may have missed uh, a portion of this, but how do chemotherapeutics from the, pa uh, you know, the chemotherapies that the patients have taken play a role in the data, or do they play a role in the data? And so were those controlled for in your study and the other study? Yeah, good question. Um, we, uh, we, we didn't look at that in detail except, as, uh, except to control for it. Um, you could imagine that uh, you could imagine that chemotherapeutics, uh, many of which are known to affect the gut microbiome, would uh, introduce a signal that we would have to detrend for, just as uh, the well-known story about diabetes and metformin. Uh, a lot of the signals originally attributed to diabetes turned out to be signals from metformin. Um, we did a series of controls where we had the same uh, type of cancer that was treated with different uh, chemotherapeutics that um, where we didn't see a strong signal from different kinds of therapeutics there. And uh, also in TCGA, the bulk of the samples are from, are from treatment naive patients. And so when we look just at the treatment naive subset, we're still able to see, uh, we're still, we're still able to see uh, very good classifier accuracy. 
Um, but that's certainly a concern if you're not using treatment naive individuals. And um, like I said, metformin provides a beautiful case where uh, the whole field was fooled for about five years in uh, chasing a whole lot of signals that people thought were due to diabetes, but were actually due to attempts to treat the diabetes. And uh, we need to be very careful uh, about that in all studies of, uh, in all studies of, um, uh, of, of clinical conditions that, that involve drug effects. Yeah, the treatment naive group uh, certainly answers the question. Um, I was also thinking about the effects of, of chemotherapeutics on the gut, right, and, and on gut. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, a, a lot of chemotherapeutic agents are known to have big impacts on the gut microbiota. Uh, I haven't seen that followed up metabolically, and uh, it'll be really interesting to know uh, what differences there are in, in terms of uh, changes in metabolic capacity. But the other, the other problem is that starting chemotherapy, uh, the, the nausea and uh, other aspects of chemotherapy typically lead people to change their diets and uh, disentangling uh, you know, disentangling the change in diet from the direct uh, impact of chemotherapeutic agents from the intersection between uh, between um, the altered microbiome and the new diet, which is going to lead to different metabolites going into the blood and uh, possibly into the tumor itself. Um, it, it seems like a challenging problem, although it doesn't seem like an insoluble problem. And uh, as, as you know, things like the technologies we're developing together and, uh, and with Rima on the U19, applying that kind of approach to cancer, I think it's going to be very exciting if we can get funding for that down the track. Thank you, Rob. Uh, oh, Margaret, is, is that a super short question because we're already late? It's a super short question. So Rob, immunotherapy has been shown to be very efficacious for certain cancers like lung cancer and so on. Wondering where you think the target is. Is it the microbiome or is it the, is not the microbiome? Yeah, um, well, so for, for immunotherapy, like the, uh, the, the pathways for PD-1, PD-L1 checkpoint inhibitor therapy, um, the, uh, the, the direct target uh, is, is definitely the tumor cells themselves, where you're disabling uh, a mechanism that would normally allow the uh, tumor cells to escape detection by the immune system. Uh, I think the role of bacteria there may be in, uh, may, may be in, um, may, may be an auxiliary role although still clearly an important role given their, uh, given their ability to modify whether the team is effective. Um, I think, uh, you know, I think it's possible that uh, having bacterial antigens on the surface of the, um, of the tumor cells may be useful for helping recruit antibodies or uh, it may be something more systemic about the immune system. A a actually, Sarkis is much better qualified to talk about those possibilities than I am since he's an actual immunologist. So uh, if, if Sarkis wants to comment, I would defer to him. Yeah, yeah, I don't know um, if, if the checkpoint inhibitors directly affect the microbiome, but there certainly um, uh, are effects on the gut as well, right? So beyond just the chemotherapeutics, IO therapeutics um, uh, can cause intestinal inflammation, can cause leaky gut. And so I, was, I think about 30% of individuals on checkpoint inhibitors will develop clinical colitis, in some cases quite severe. So you can really? imagine that in the subclinical cases, there could be some, some yeah, dysbiosis some changes in the microbiome, but they may have um, um, some of the readouts that Rob's looked at and the tumor itself. But that's that's fascinating. I didn't know the GI involvement was anything like that high. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's pretty substantial. In fact, there are people now developing drugs for those individuals who have to come off checkpoint inhibitors because of their colitis. Uh, yeah, well, that, that's that's certainly worth a more detailed uh, a more detailed study then. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Rob. Um, uh, great talk. Uh, great discussion. Um, it's uh, already time to uh, move on and listen to Sarkis' opinion. Again. Um, so Sarkis is um, Louise B. and Nelly Sook's professor of microbiology and heritage. Uh, PI at uh, Caltech, uh, California in the US. Um, I, uh, I saw in, oh, I forgot to uh, pause the video. So uh, we say goodbye to the video for a second, because, for a few minutes, because Sarkis is going to present new material. So I, in the video recording, there's absolutely no risk that I, as a philosopher, would present new data that would be uh, too uh, competitive. Uh, at least new thinking. 
<laughs> that, 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 that could be possible, yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to uh, uh, conclude in a certain sense this uh, uh, um, uh, series of meetings uh, by giving a very short talk, um, uh, in a way uh, giving a kind of conclusion on what we've been doing in the last five years in my ERC-funded uh, project. So again, I wanted to thank you all for uh, participating in this meeting today and the previous meetings uh, uh, in the uh, last three weeks. Um, let me uh, try to share my computer, uh, my screen, sorry. Uh, so if I do this, can you, can you see full screen? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, okay. So, uh, what I'm going to uh, present is a few elements about what research on the microbiota tells us about biological individuality. And the very uh, uh, simple question I'm asking is really about to what extent the microbiota research recently has had an impact on our conception or conceptions of biological individuality. And immediately when you ask a question like that, um, you have to raise all sorts of interesting questions, I think. First, which microbiome, so to speak, which microbiome are we talking about? Only resident or also transient microbes? All members or only some members? Only bacteria or also viruses and other components, including fungi, archaea, etc. Are we talking about the microbiome itself or its products? And we see several examples of that today. And when we talk about biological individuality, um, which taxa are we going to apply to that question of biological individuality? At which level are we going to apply the question of individuality? Are we talking about the individuality of cells, of organs, of organism, of superorganisms, etc.? So this is a series of questions which can be raised on the basis of biology itself. On the side of philosophy, uh, different questions are going to be, what dimension of biological individuality are you talking about? Which conception of biological individuality are you talking about? So this is what I'm going to open up for you today, that kind of questions. And I'm going to make three main claims. First, addressing the problem of the impact of microbiota research on our conception of biological individuality requires, requires an alliance of philosophers and biologists. This sounds a little bit naive, but in fact, my point will be that both philosophers and biologists have been narrow-minded. They have had a too narrow perspective on biological individuality. So what I suggest is that addressing the problem of the impact of the microbiome research on biological individuality um, requires an extension of both questions and approaches to biological individuality. So I'm, I'm advocating pluralism at two levels, at the level of the questions that we're going to distinguish when we talk about biological individuality. I'm going to clarify this in a second. And also the different types of biological approaches that we're going to consider. And my third claim is that the assessment of the impact of current microbiome research on our conception of biological individuality will depend on those dimensions and questions that we decide to consider. It's a little bit abstract as it is, but I'm going to make that more concrete in a second. I want to say a few words about how biologists talk about individuality in microbiota research. Then I want to present my uh, view of philosophy as a toolbox to better understand biological individuality. This is a view I share with many people uh, present here today. And I want to illustrate uh, the reasoning by one example, which is the example on which I have worked mainly, which is the key role of immune microbiota interface in constructing biological individuality. So first, how do biologists talk about individuality in microbiota research? The first thing I want to say is that biologists have been talking about biological individuality for decades, if not for centuries. This is very important to um, 
resist the idea that that would be only a question for philosophers. This is clearly not the case. Uh, Medawar, Buss, Maynard Smith, Michaud, Pepper and Heron, um, uh, Foss and Ralph Garden, many others, as biologists, have raised directly the question of what biological individuality is and how to define it. And this question has been raised about many types of organisms, including, of course, non-mammals, non-vertebrates, which was very important for many of these biologists. So including colonial organisms or clonal organisms or superorganisms, for example. And of course, uh, biologists have also talked about biological individuality within microbiota research. And there, uh, they have made very different claims. Some have said that Research from the microbiota contributes to discussions about biological individuality. But others have said that research on the microbiota changes or even revolutionizes discussions over biological individuality. Many examples of interesting and strong claims. So one claim that was absolutely essential in my own um, developmental biology was the claims made by Scott Gilbert in this paper in 2002, where Scott was inspired by Margaret and a few others, Hooper, Golden, and others, and suggested this idea of a permeable, a permeable eye. And then uh, Scott and, and Jan Sapp and Fred Tauber suggested this idea that we have never been individuals in 2011. Other examples include Blazer, Who Are We?, Rob Knight and others, our microbial selves, or uh, Rhys, Bosch, Douglas, how the microbiome challenges our concept of self, or Kundu, Blacher, Elena, and Pedersen, our, our gut microbiome, the evolving inner self. Other examples, uh, Jeffrey Golden, for example, Thomas Bosch and Margaret McFonnay, or Gera on the concept of superorganism in immunology. And I want to uh, point out that there are three frequent attitudes among biologists, which I think might be slightly problematic. First, they often tend to reduce biological individuality to the question of inter-individual variation and ultimately to uniqueness. So biological individuality will be about the uniqueness of individuals. And this is something that is very often done in microbiome research. Very often, this is what they mean when they talk about biological individuality. And this is not very surprising because for a very long time, and examples include love in the 1930s, for example, or Medawar in the 1940s and 1950s, for a very long time, when biologists have talked about uh, biological individuality, what they've talked about mainly is this question of inter-individual variation. But there is more to biological individuality than just inter-individual variation. Second, sometimes biologists have tended to reduce biological individuality to just one meaning, typically the question of insularity, the question uh, uh, being in that case, to what extent an individual is insular, is close to its environment. And this is something, for example, that led Scott and, and Sub and Tauber to suggest that we have never been individuals. What they mean by their, their eliminativism, eliminativism, when they say uh, it, biological individuality is a problematic notion, they mean that biological individuality understood as insularity is a notion that we should get rid of. But again, there is much more to biological individuality than just insularity. And third, biologists often have a tendency to consider that one dimension of biological individuality is equivalent to another or involves another. For example, very often in biological papers, you will see that the question of delineation, I'm going to define in a second, and cohesion go together as if they were the same thing, which is not true. Or persistence and uniqueness are put together often as if they were the same thing, which is not true. So biologists often talk about biological individuality, we just saw that, but the problem is that it's not always clear what biologists mean by biological individuality, because often they don't define what they mean. It's not always clear to what extent these different senses overlap or maybe interact one with the other. Whether, limit, whether the question of biological individuality they have in mind is limited to humans or to vertebrates or much wider than that. And fourth, 
whether other useful interpretations of biological individuality could be considered. Philosophy, especially metaphysics and metaphysically informed philosophy of science, I suggest here can help. Philosophy can be understood as a toolbox to better understand biological individuality. So how can philosophy help? Philosophy can contribute to address the four challenges I just mentioned that we find within the biology literature. Why? Mainly because philosophy has a long history of thinking about those issues. Aristotle, Locke, Leibniz, Hume, and many others. So the resources I'm suggesting to use here are very common resources for philosophers. The history of philosophy itself, metaphysics, including recent metaphysicians, and also history of science. This is something that is very well illustrated in the volume put together by uh, Scott Lidgard and Lynn Nihart. Oh, sorry, there's a, uh, it's Nihart with, a, with an H in 2017, where they use the history of science to show the history of those questions and the fact that, for example, in the 19th century, all the questions we think are um, emerging now about individuality, in fact, were already raised in different ways, which can be very informative for our thinking today. So this is the very connected to the idea of uh, Stephen French and Terry McKenzie that metaphysics should be understood as a toolbox. So I really like this idea of a toolbox. And I think that from this point of view, philosophy should be just a tool or a set of tools, mainly with two roles. I think philosophy indeed can be used as a filter and as a generator. What do I mean by this? I mean that we can start with the questions raised by biologists about biological individuality in different fields, with different approaches within each field, and philosophy can be used as a filter to precisely select and reorganize biologist questions thanks to the classic tools of philosophy, conceptual analysis, history of metaphysics, history of philosophy in general, the capacity of philosopher to often build new connections between different fields, et cetera, et cetera. And also these philosophical tools can be used to generate, so this is the generator aspect, new questions that then will inform biology itself and made it possible for biologists to ask new questions or to ask questions in a different way. This is the series of metaphysical distinctions, which are very classic in metaphysics, that I suggest to retain for an application to biology. So I'm certainly not saying that all metaphysics or all metaphysical distinctions are useful to understand biological individuality from within biology, so to speak. But I'm, I'm, I, I am saying that these concepts here are useful to keep in mind and to distinguish when we think about individuality from a biological point of view. And these five ideas are countability, can I count individuals, one thing, two things, three things, delineation, this is about the boundaries, persistence, this is the uh, identity through time, so one thing is the same through time even though it changes constantly, and cohesion, and finally, the peculiar characterization of each individual, which often leads to the idea of uniqueness. As we saw, this is very often this fifth meaning that biologists have in mind when they talk about biological individuality. So the very general idea is that an individual is accountable, relatively well delineated. In fact, I should say everything is relatively something here. So it is a relatively countable, relatively well delineated, rel relatively cohesive unit in the living world that remains relatively the same through time, often with peculiar or even unique characteristics. So this sounds like a very general definition, but the suggestion here is that you're not going to do the same things within biology if you adopt one or the other of these different five meanings. So they are informative for biologists to think about biological individuality. That's, that's the idea. So I want to emphasize the fact that, of course, there's a long tradition of philosophers of biology thinking about biological individuality. And in addition, many philosophers of biology have explored, often with passion, the idea that biological individuality would be impacted by new research on microbiota. Often they have thought very fiercely over some questions. I think they also face challenges, those philosophers they have generally not taken into account the full lessons of metaphysics. 
Instead, they have reduced the question to one or two aspects of individuality. Often, for example, countability, they have emphasized the importance of countability. Countability is crucial, but it's also very important to keep in mind the other meanings, which can be as crucial as countability, depending on context and depending on the kind of questions that biology will want to raise. And second, philosophers of biology have generally not taken into account the full essence of biology in all its diversity. Instead, they have very often focused on evolution, so the question of evolutionary individuality, often the question of units of reproduction, as in the idea of Darwinian individuals, for example, which is great and extremely important, and which leads to all sorts of questions about holobionts, which are exactly the kind of questions that we discussed in some of the previous meetings. But what I'm suggesting here is that it is very important to keep in mind that this is just one type of question about biological individuality, and many biologists raise that question with very different objectives in mind than those which raise the question within the question of, within the field of evolutionary biology. And perhaps what I'm suggesting here is that some of the disagreement that I think we all observe between biologists who are super enthusiastic, even excited about new research on the microbiota, they say it does change something about individuality. And very often philosophers of biology are very conservative or skeptic about that. And they say, no, it doesn't change much about this. And in fact, what I'm suggesting here is that part of the question or part of the gap is just a gap between what kind of uh, biological processes we've been interested in. And clearly, philosophy of biology has been dominated by questions which have to do with evolution biology, which is great. But very often, I think philosophers of biology neglect what is going on right now in the kind of research that for example, Margaret or, or Thomas Bosch or Sarkis or Rob or Gerard presented today or the, previous, or the previous talks. And I think this is very important to understand what's going on in the field and to understand why sometimes philosophers of biology seem to be a little bit late with some of the considerations that are made right now within other fields of biology than evolution. So recall, my idea is that both biologists and philosophers of biology have tended to have a too narrow perspective on biological individuality. And what I'm saying is that we should try to widen, to open up questions about biological individuality and biological approaches able to address these questions. So the one example I want to give is immunology. And the question is to what extent immunology has impacted our question, uh, our conception of biological individuality. And to what extent this impact is mediated by what we now know about interaction between the immune system and the microbiota. So I'm going to be very quick on this. If immunology has been considered central to understand biological individuality in the last five decades or so, it's mainly for three reasons. It's mainly because the immune system plays a very important role in the filtering of our entry. It says, this is going to come inside. This is not going to come inside a given biologi biological unit. In addition, the immune system uh, plays a key role in filtering our presence. It's not just about monitoring the borders. It's about constantly interacting with components within the biological unit under consideration and filtering over presence. You can stay here, you cannot stay here. And it's also a, a system that plays a key role in biological plasticity, the construction of the individual through time. So what I'm suggesting here is that the immune system is important for filtering over entry, and this is something that is going to be matched in our metaphysical distinction. So you see, I'm doing some bio biological distinctions and metaphysical distinctions. I'm trying to determine to what extent they match. And the idea is that filtering over entry says something about countability, delineation, and persistence. So boundaries and uh, transtemporal identity. Filtering over presence tells us something about persistence and cohesion. And plasticity tells us something crucial about uniqueness. Biological individuality understood as the basis of the continuous unification of a plurality of constituents is the very simple idea that every organism is a multi-species collective made of heterogeneous elements, but I suggest that this is 
a strongly unified collective. And I suggest that the immune system plays a key role in unifying the plurality of these constituents. So this is absolutely crucial for me to determine to what extent some microbes are not rejected by the immune system and why they are not rejected by the immune system. For example, they are going to be compartmentalized but not rejected. What's going on there? What does it say about individuality is the kind of questions I'm, I'm interested in. Clearly, immunity plays a key role in biological individuality, but not understood as insularity and not understood as, uh, as with the old self, non-self distinction. So I think what is very important here is to understand that the immune system is absolutely crucial to understand biological individuality. But what is more interesting, uh, uh, I think, is the fact that all the effects that the immune system has on our conception of bi biological individuality are in fact impacted by the microbiome. Why? Because the immune system and the microbiome intimately interact they co-construct and they are co-realized. I don't have time to go through this. The idea is very simple. Interactions are uh, extremely intimate and important between the immune system and uh, uh, the microbiome. We have several examples here. We don't need to go into the details. Um, there is also the fact, which is absolutely crucial, that there is a co-construction between the immune system and the microbiota. And I think there are many fantastic examples of that. For example, work done by Mark Davis and others on the essential role of CMV in influencing immune responses. This is much more than anything like genetic factors, for example. And I think we have many examples of that. And recently we suggested, especially with Thomas Bazin and Lin Chu, the idea that in fact, even immune recognition and immune effects are mediated by a conjunction of host components and components of the microbiome. This is, uh, for example, what is often uh, um, uh, described in this uh, idea of co-immunity and also in the idea of col um, colonization resistance. So the very simple idea here is that the immune system impacts our views about biological individuality in all sorts of ways, these five notions, and each time the microbiome plays a decisive role in this influence of the immune system on our conception of biological individuality. So immunology here is just one example of uh, an expanded exploration uh, of the type I was describing before. What we did in our research is to, is to start with what immunologists say about biological uh, individuality to then open up the possible meanings and dimensions of biological individuality in immunology, then to show how current immunology addresses these different dimensions, then to show how current immunology that focuses on immune microbiota interactions addresses these different dimensions. And then we uh, try to show that uh, immunology's lesson about biological individuality should be combined with the lessons of other biological fields, including other physiological fields, but also evolutionary approaches to individuality. So here again, the idea is just to open up questions, open up possibilities, open up examples, and see how they match. So using again philosophy as a series of toolbox to open up possibilities, and maybe to correct the um, limitations of both a biological perspective, a purely biological perspective, or a purely philosophical perspective on individuality. So philosophy can help generate new questions. Biology uh, is indispensable in this process because it leads to new approaches and new examples. I advocated uh, pluralism and extension. I think eliminativism and monism are doomed to fail if we want to talk about biological individuality. I think much work is needed in each case. So I think what we have tried to do in the project with immunology, and maybe we did not do that right, but I mean, the idea was to do the kind of program I'm talking about for immunology. I think exactly the same kind of programs can be done and should be done, for example, in neuroscience, in psychology, in many other fields. Again, it requires a lot of work and it requires collaboration between philosophers and biologists to be successful. 
Here, I just took the example of the immune system, and I tried to show that the microbiota has a major impact on the contribution of the immune system to biological individuality. And I try to suggest that this microbiome immune system influence is a contribution to all major aspects of biological individuality, the five aspects that we have distinguished. With this, I want to thank all the people mentioned here. I want to thank uh, the European Research Council uh, for funding. Uh, it has been uh, a great pleasure to uh, um, uh, manage this project, to conduct this project. And I really want to thank all current and past members of the ERC IDEM project and all our group in Bordeaux. And I want to thank you for your attention. And I'm ready, I think, to take any questions. Uh, Ford, you are first, I think. I'm, I'm there. I'm, I think I'm unmuted now. Um, well, I think you probably anticipate this question because um, I think I've asked it before. Um, uh, to define something like individuality for bacteria or even for viruses becomes a bit problematic because even if bacteria might be said to have an immune system, it's not at all homologous to the vertebrate immune system. And the viruses, I can't actually think of anything that a virus has that qualifies as that. So, answer about that. Obviously, you thought about this. I, I did think about it, but it remains a very challenging question. So, uh, clearly, what I've been interested in is uh, different uh, uh, types of immune system doing the same kind of uh, tasks or doing the same kind of activities, regardless of homology. So, clearly, uh, there are some homologies, but clearly if something realizes the kind of functions or activities are attributed to the immune system, then it is an immune system. So this is a definition that I posit in my book, like this is, this is, uh, this is an immune process and this is an immune system. And in this view, uh, CRISPR-Cas, for example, clearly qualifies as an immune system in archaea and bacteria where it is found. And there are other processes that can qualify as well. It remains clearly extreme, extremely complicated to uh, uh, determine to what extent we can use these immunological lens to understand, for example, something about the individuality of a virus or the individuality of bacteria that, that do not seem to have an equivalent of an immune system. I'm not saying this is universal. What I'm saying is that this is extremely powerful when we can identify immunological processes. Okay, sure. For, for example, um, I, I, I think some of the discussions last time about, uh, ex especially with Samir, I think, for example, the question to what extent viruses are replicators is, is a question of biological individuality. I think this is an important question. It cannot be reduced to the question, is it an organism? Contrary, I think, to what Samir was saying. And it cannot be reduced to, uh, is it an immunological individual? So I'm, very, I'm really a pluralist. So I think some of the, of, of the, of the, the uh, uh, living things or, or living whatever we're talking about here are not going to be uh, understandable with my immunological approaches. I think many will, and I think it would be a mistake not to try to take that into account and combine that with other approaches. That's the message. OK, thanks. Thank you. Uh, so I think uh, Maria was second. Yeah, um, Toma, I, I think it's very interesting, uh, this concept. Uh, and uh, it also um, points to the fact that, uh, for instance, if you have ba uh, bacteria, um, the, uh, not only the species, but then you, you have the strain. I mean, within the species, uh, every bacteria uh, can have different activities. So there is an individuality in the individuality, which I think is, uh, is very important. Can you, can you say more about this? So what is the individuality within the individuality? It's the individuality. Yeah, because uh, let's say if you take a Lactobacillus paracaseae, for instance, if you don't specify which particular strain you're talking about, you may have bacteria that have different functions. And uh, there was uh, one of the papers uh, that came out on, uh, um, on the activity of, of the microbiota in cancer therapy. Uh, in, that, uh, in that paper, they were showing this Enterococcus hire, 
and they and they had two species. One was uh, 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 favoring cancer immunotherapy. The other one was opposing cancer immunotherapy. And they were exactly the same species, two different strains. So uh, I think it's really very important this concept of uh, of individuality. Okay, thank you. That's very useful. So yeah, in my case, one of the one of the main um, uh, required requirements is to identify the, the entity to which the individuality is going to apply. But yeah, yeah. I, I take your point as, a, as another way of uh, showing that uh, the reply to that question is going to depend on many components, on many aspects, including uh, bacteria strains. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Stephanie. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you so much for allowing me to join. Um, this has been really fascinating and I, I really enjoyed your talk, Tomas. And um, I have a very general question that um, this has been very thought provoking. So um, do you, okay, so considering that not all host organisms are created equal in their reliance on microbiomes and microbiota, um, do you have a kind of idea of a generalizable theory that would pertain or that would help explain what is leading to um, different levels of reliance on uh, non-host entities that integrate with the host, um, so microbiomes. And it seems that you're really getting towards this, this kind of idea with the immunological concept and we think also in metabolism as well. But do you, do you have maybe some kind of insights on, on this notion of what is really driving? Because obviously it's not phylogenetic, um, it's not environmental based. So I'm just curious your thoughts on that. This is a very good question, and I don't have, a, of course, a, a good answer to that question. Um, uh, my, my own perspective on this has been uh, quite uh, mechanistic, in fact. So I, I think that what's going on with the immune system is really a question of, uh, it is really a question about kinetics. I think this is really what's going on. So I mean, this is really a question of, what am I going to do when something is a rapid change? What I'm going to do if it is not a rapid change? And I think this is the this is mainly the way in which an immune system responds to something. So I think this is why progressively emerging tumors are tolerated. This is why uh, some components of the microbiota are going to be tolerated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So clearly, I don't think for the immune system it's a question of phylog phylogeny. I don't think it's necessarily a question of functions as such, even though this is something we discuss very often with Gregor and others in the, in the group. I really think this is that kind of thing that have shaped the immune systems, the different immune systems through time. So this is not a good answer to your question, but I think this is not necessarily the driver, but I think this is probably what, this is where I would start in terms of asking the, the kind of questions you're, ask, you're, you're, you're asking. So this is the best I can do right now, sorry. Um, Gérard. Yes, thank you, Thomas, for, for, this, uh, for this very nice uh, discussion. Um, I have two points, uh, two questions that I try to to express them, it, it, it's, it won't be easy because it's a bit uh, diffuse in my head. The first is about the validity to consider the immune system as a, as a tool. Um, you seem to suggest that the immune system uh, sets or is able to define a boundary. And you talk about uh, acceptance or rejection or tolerance. Uh, in my view, there's no such thing. Uh, I know tolerance is, is something which is uh, used a lot by immunologists, but I don't think it really exists in my view. And in my opinion, you know, the, even the term immune system is very misleading. It, it is a product of history more than really science. And in the end, you know, the immune system is just a, a, a system of cells and molecules which leads to maintain homeostasis of the, of the organism. And there are other systems, you know, the, the nervous system does the same, and it also, you might try to define a boundary set by the nervous system, but it does not really. It really, the aim is to set a homeostasis, not to set a boundary, in my opinion. So in my view, using the immune system to define a, a individuality is kind of flawed because of what we perceive from the immune system. 
And the second, uh, the second point I try to express is the, the notion of individuality. I'm, now it makes me think of uh, what, uh, what some has, uh, have expressed uh, concerning the, the, the uh, uh, quantum theory. Some said that since we are part of the cosmos, it's going to be difficult to really understand it. And you know, individuality sometimes feels like something very metaphysical. In our, uh, uh, in our uh, ancient oriental uh, philosophies, Taoism or Buddhism propose that there's, a, there's not really individuals, there's an individual kind of soul or consciousness, and then we are just vehicles of that. So I'm just wondering whether or not the, the, even the, the concept of individuality is something which is basically just the product of our consciousness and does not really exist. And see, it, since we are part of it, it's even worse to study. And I have the impression that the, the confusion throughout the years and the difficulty to define this kind of proof of that, of, of, that, uh, of uh, the, uh, the difficulty uh, to discuss the concept. So it's certainly, it's certainly part of the difficulty of the problem. This has been uh, in the minds of philosophers for a very long time. So not only in uh, Buddhism, which of course is a, a very interesting example, but also in um, Western philosophy, this question of the dissolution of individuality, that it would be something just in, your, in our mind or you know, something like that has been present. And I think this is very important to uh, uh, consider this, uh, this question. In my view, um, it is very pragmatic. I think we often need in biology to count, to delineate each time very approximately. I'm not saying this is going to be all oh, clear cut boundaries or, or this is unique, or this, but this is very important for us sometimes to say this mouse is different from this mouse. Or, is this the mouse in which yesterday I injected that product or is it not? Is it uh, the kind of persistent um, organism that we've been talking about? For example, I did something, what are the consequences? <laughs> I'm very pragmatic with that. I'm just saying this is the kind of question we have to ask in our science. And we cannot ask those questions without disentangling some of their aspects. And my impression is that very often biologists just just for the sake of simplicity or whatever, we'll consider one aspect as if it, it were equivalent to all the other aspects, for example, or it was an entry point into all the other aspects. If you're right that we should get rid of individuality altogether, this is very interesting, but I think the first target is going to be biology rather than philosophy. Philosophy is ready for that. I mean, philosophy has been thinking about different ways of, of um, conceiving things uh, for a very long time. And maybe we have to throw all that, but I think my main perspective is very pragmatic. I don't, you know, uh, it, it's not because uh, one rejects individuality that you reject counting. No, you count, you count objects, you count uh, points on the screen which are reflecting number of cells, you count the number of leaves of a tree, but you don't, you don't need, you know, if I, if I go back to pragmatism, you don't need to invoke the, the concept of individuality, you just count objects which are defined by, by whatever, whatever you want. You can, you can count a society of ends or an end by itself. Okay. In that case, I invite you, Gérard, to listen to uh, the, 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 the talk of Samuel Kasha last week, which I think was perfect for that. Uh, okay. if, I, if, I, if, I, if I enter your office and I say, Gérard, count or count objects, you will, you will have no idea how to answer my questions. My question. So the question is, count what? And when you say count what, you start determining what will count as an object for a given question. And that question involves a question of individuality. So we should not project our pre-notion of individuality of, on, on what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is a super general um, series of categorization that we use all the time in daily life and we have to use in daily life and we also have to use in our science. If we want to get rid of that, it's, it's possible, but it's gonna be uh, pretty difficult. And clearly, for example, it is impossible to count without a certain notion of individuality. This is what I'm saying. And this is what metaphysics suggests. Yeah, I, I guess we can discuss uh, years about it, but uh... I don't see, I think, you know, wanting to put individuality on counting objects or to define objects 
is 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 the problem at the heart because I mean, okay, why, why do why do we count? Let's count. Uh, I don't know leaves on the tree. Okay, but why should I consider? I know, uh, you know, when you when you when you when you analyze a picture of histology, oftentimes my, my postdocs have to define what they count. So they make a circle around the nucleus or in the size of the, but it doesn't mean individuality. It just means objects. I think object is a much more neutral term. And we d does not need or, or necessitate you now something more profound like individuality. Well, no, because I mean, uh, indeed, it's going to be too long. But uh, objects can be uh, collective or in collective objects or individual objects, and and both can be counted. And this is really one of the main uh, uh, questions, which I think has been uh, uh, raised by uh, questions about individuality. Again, I think you have a a certain preconception of individuality and you're like a point cannot be an individual a chair cannot be an individual or 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 or, 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 or part of my screen cannot be an individual but it can perfectly be an individual for philosophers this is no problem philosophers will apply the the, the different criteria i talked about in all sorts of different uh, situations and they will count as an individual something that many people would would not intuitively count as an individual I see. Well, okay. Uh, uh, Joanna and then Lisa. Hi. Hello. Hello. Um, thanks, Tomas. That was such a great talk. Um, and thank you for organizing these meetings, which have been just so thought provoking. Thank you. Um, for I was. Um, I'm interested in articulations and representation of the holobiont body and public health. Um, and so listening to your talk, I was wondering if you know of any research that's framing biological individuality within the context of public health policy. And it, uh, it, it struck me that that would be one very sort of practical, concrete um, application for definitions for challenging the boundaries of individuality. Yeah, so I, I, there are some elements uh, of that and for that in, uh, for example, as you know, in, uh, in uh, 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 Rob Knight's uh, uh, work, for example. So I've seen some uh, examples of that, but I'm not an uh, uh, expert on this question. Maybe people in the audience, so to speak, know more about it. Uh, but yeah I, I, yeah, I have just a rough idea about some, uh, some, some options here. Mm. Other people, maybe? Okay, so yeah, let's, yeah, I think it's very important. And, uh, and if you can uh, keep us updated about that, that would be, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Lisa, and then I think we'll stop because I'm sure everyone is exhausted after a long uh, series of talks. Uh, Tamar, I, I want to say, I think that um, in the context of your talk, you illustrated uh, what you've put together with your conference and all these weeks so perfectly, the combination of philosophical and biological folks in exchanging ideas and information so ideally and so perfectly so that we can learn to expand our ideas about individuality and expand our ideas about these interrelations that you're talking about. Um, with regard to biological individuality. It's just been perfect. And um, I just wanted to say that before I ask my question. Um, your, um, I, I, I use an approach I call the logic of and, and pragmatics of research questions in order to set up um, uh, problems or research um, and to understand and analyze research. And it seems to me that um, a handy way to go into a question about biological individuality is to um, get straight on what the researchers are considering their possible and responsive answers to their questions. I mean, what would they accept as being an individual? What would they accept as um, being defined as um, an individual of any kind or would not accept as being defined as an individual? And of course, the answer to that question um, brings in all their background beliefs and brings in all of their assumptions, brings in their 
theory. It brings in their unconscious beliefs about um, what's an individual, what counts as biology, what counts as an interaction, and so forth and so on. And, and, and so this is why I find it to be a useful way to approach analyzing scientific interactions. It's because it brings on in all the background and kind of opens it up for inspection um, so that we can then do the work that you're talking about doing. Um, so I, I just wanted to offer that as a, um, a just an idea to uh, help help out. Um, but um, I, I was I was so intrigued by your diagram that had the Darwinian individuals and then the interactors and then the physiological individuals. But I was wondering why part of the physiological individuals were outside of the factor circle. I was wondering <laughs> how that worked. Uh, thank you so much for your very nice comments and suggestions. That's that's very that's very good. So yeah, uh, um, about uh, physiological individuals. So this has been a long, um, as you know, a long um, uh, a reflection I've tried to make on why philosophers of biology have focused so much on evolutionary individuality. Right, right. Think there are very good reasons for that, and I, I, I've tried to understand physiological individuality and I've I've been through all sorts of um, disagreements with myself about how I should do that like is physiological individuality uh, the the complement of evolutionary individuality in the sense that most reflections we can make uh, are going to be part of physiological individuality so including immunological individuality for example or is it not the case um, and for example approaches like uh, ecological approaches to individuality, should they be considered close to physiological individuality or not? So the reason why my diagram was a little bit small on my slide is that I'm not entirely sure now about, you know, <laughs> how to represent that and should I take the risk of representing that? My only point I think is a type of pluralism, which I hope is not too naive, which is to say it's a combination-based pluralism. This is what I'm talking about. So what I'm talking about is constantly ask people to put together different perspectives. If not, yeah. I think we uh, run the risk of being extremely narrow in our conclusions. Yeah. And I think this is something that has been the case within philosophy of biology talking about biological individuality. So for me, it has both been one of the main uh, realizations or achievements of philosophy of biology in the last 30 years or so, but also something I found a little bit incomplete. And I'm, I'm really struggling to try to uh, convince other people, many, many do it already, but to convince other people to think about individuality from all sorts of different perspectives. Clearly, interactor is one and has been one for a very long time. And I think it would be a mistake to now say evolutionary individuality is just about um, reproducing units, for example. I think this is much more complicated than that. And I'm trying to do the same with question having to do with physiological individuality, but exactly how all this fits together in a schema or a diagram. Um, no, I don't want to do that anymore. Well, I don't know if you can put it all in one picture because I think they are different logic of research questions examples. I think that one is one research program and the other is another research program. Yeah. And so they don't really go together in the same example. For example, using my idea of the logic of research questions, I don't, I, I actually don't think that, that, that because, I think that because they represent such totally different research programs, um, that their answers are restricted to their answers to their questions, and they they actually aren't going to be commensurate. Um, the the way you just said. Yeah, yeah. So we definitely agree, but then I think we we also agree on the fact that in some cases, philosophers can help to, if not make those uh, research programs. Uh, um, um, <laughs> Yeah. Commensurate. At, at least we can help uh, uh, um, make these uh, different research programs meet and try to see what they have in common, and I think, or what they could do together. You know, something like that. And I think that is one of the the important I, roles we might have as philosophers. I agree. I agree. It's a beautiful idea, and and you've really gone a long way towards doing that with these conferences. 
Thank you very much, Lisa. That's, that's very nice. I really want to thank you all. I know it's very late. I know it's been the fourth uh, virtual meeting, but I must say I'm very impressed by the number of attendees and your incredible resistance to uh, sleep uh, from, from all places in the world. So thank you so much for uh, uh, participating in these uh, uh, meetings. I want to add one last thing, which is that I'm, I am going to try to organize a physical conference in Bordeaux in October or November. I don't expect a majority of you to come, but I hope that some of you will come and, and, and will be in, in, in a situation to come. We, we, we will anyway have to spend the, 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 the ERC money before the end of the year, so we will organize a conference. My idea is that I will gather people uh, from France and people from Europe. It's a little bit like a concentric conception of conference, of a conference. So people from France, people from Europe, and people from all, all over the world. So I will try to invite some of you, and I hope that some of you will make it. Uh, if not, I think those virtual meetings uh, have been not as good as a, a real conference, but still, I was very, very happy about it and about them. And I really want to thank you one last time for, for that. Thank you, Tom. It was, it was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, and don't Thank forget you. our individualities. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay. See you uh, soon, uh, all of you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.